Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero. Uh, you know, today we're going to have to cover the Patreon situation because, uh, and if people are watching this video on demand quite a bit later, you may have forgotten about this incident and now are just recalling, oh hey, remember that time when Patreon was a thing and then over one weekend the entire thing collapsed and then they all went out of business? Um, Basically, uh, for those of you who aren't aware of the situation regarding Patreon or perhaps don't even know what Patreon is, Patreon is a service that allowed people to create an account and solicit uh, contributions for projects they were working on. And people could go on there and pledge small money amounts or large amounts. They could pledge $1,000 to this person or they could pledge $1 to this person. It didn't matter. Uh, and then the person could optionally also offer rewards like with uh, Kickstarter or those kinds of um, project funding models do. Uh, but that's all it was, right? So it's just a site where you could go and create um, a essentially like, it's not really a donation because you're not a charity, but it's basically that. It's basically saying, hey, I'm working on this project. If you'd like to donate money to it, uh, it's much appreciated. You don't have to, right? Uh, and occasionally, depending on the Patreon, it might also be that if you donate money to it, you get a, a bonus, right? Like maybe maybe this project is creating a comic strip, and if you donate to it, you will get um, access to our special, like, you know, art book PDF or something, right? That you wouldn't have gotten otherwise, or I've seen people, like, they give out the comic one day early from when they post it online. So, you know, you get some benefits for being a donor, those sorts of things. <clears throat> Uh, and so that is what Patreon was, and uh, Handmade Hero is, you know, it's a commercial project. Um, it's like half and half. Uh, it's making a game, and, and the game and the source code still cost $15 to buy. It's a commercial project. Um, but it does have a free side, which is we give away all the videos for free, um, and we put up all the programming resources for free that we do. <clears throat> However... Uh, we created a Patreon a while back, not too long after the start of the series, because people were requesting a way to donate money to the project. Uh, and so we did, and we've had one for a long time, and it created, uh, it's generated quite a bit of money because it's been running for like three, three years or so, and it, it probably collected, I think, somewhere around $60,000, which is a lot of money. Uh, and what we've been doing with that money is actually giving, giving it away. Uh, most of the time I would turn around and give away, uh, the, the vast majority of the money that came in on the Patreon, uh, to other projects that were, people had started based on Handmade Hero, because this seemed like the most fair way to deal with the money. And there's been a lot of great stuff that has been supported by this money in the past. Uh, the annotated episode guide is one of them. Um, that's one that probably a lot of you are familiar with, and that's just at hero.handmade.network slash episodes. Uh, and this is an amazing resource uh, done by uh, Miblo uh, from the chat and by Asaf Gartner. He made the search engine. Um, and uh, it's basically a thing where you can just type in anything you want, like, you know, cube or something. Um, and it will tell you any time I did a major thing on that at all, right? And this is just an amazing resource because Handmade Hero is not really meant to be a concise project. By default, it's just me doing a bunch of programming and showing what comes up when you do it. And so it's very hard to access it in a random access fashion. But this resource is amazing and it's helped so many people. And that is what we gave a significant portion of the Patreon money to over the years. Uh, similarly, this entire site, right, which is Handmade Network, this was all made by volunteers. Um, Abner Coimbre basically took it upon himself to organize uh, a bunch of people to create this site. And then like uh, Andrew Conister and I can never pronounce his name, but Kalimian uh, on the uh, on the chat. His name is Jeruin, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, but they like, and, and a bunch of other people, I don't even know all the people who are involved, uh, built this entire site, which hosts that episode guide, not to mention all these other wonderful products that people are making. See, Handmade Hero is just one of several projects on here uh, that have been awesome. Uh, and that are just, I mean, like, there's just so much great stuff going on here. And it supports uh, forums for them, news for them. Uh, and, of course, stuff like that episode guide uh, has now has a place uh, to live. And so that was another thing that we sent a bunch of money to. So we tried to, like, cover their hosting costs. And we, we would send quite a bit of money uh, out of our take every month to them. And in addition, we also supported a number of projects that we use on the stream. We sent money to uh, Alan Webster's Awesome Four Coder project, which, of course, is the editor we use on stream. Um, I mean, it's literally we replaced the editor we were using by one written by someone um, who uh, was a viewer of the series originally, right? 
And the same was true of our drawing program. Uh, Sergio uh, created the Milton drawing package, and that's the drawing package that we use on StreamNow to replace Mischief, which is what we used originally. Um, and so this money that came in for the Patreon, even though it was not the thing that we were using to make money for, for like, for Molly Rocket, um, it was making money for a lot of people, and those people were doing amazing work. So I definitely am happy with how the Patreon thing worked out. It got money from people who wanted to donate money to this project to people who did great stuff, right? It, it did exactly what it was supposed to do in my mind in terms of um, contributors supporting volunteers on a project, right? And uh, I'll be honest, Patreon's kind of a janky system. It didn't make it easy to do this. Uh, I basically had to like make these pledges and pay for the pledges first, and then it would like recover the pledges the next month, and I had to like reimburse myself. It was, it they didn't make it as easy as it should have been, um, but it worked, right? I mean, hey, it got the money to the right place eventually so that people who wanted to, to contribute money to the project could contribute money and it went somewhere good, right? And that never would have happened without Patreon. So, you know, I feel like they deserve some credit for that. On the other hand, um, they definitely have been having kind of a streak, if you will, of really bad sort of public facing issues happening. And while none of these issues have been, I would say, um, you know, really catastrophically underhanded or weird in and of themselves, perhaps, it is kind of getting to the point now where it's really not a very comfortable platform to encourage people to support. And it's really not a platform that I want to be associated with anymore. If for no other reason, even if we take out any of the decisions or my personal opinions about them or any of that stuff, just the general public perception of Patreon amongst people who use the service is rapidly declining. And I don't really want to be associated with a platform uh, that is that its own users are feeling like uh, is mistreating them, right? I mean, that's just not a company and it's not a product that you want to be associated with, especially not when you're talking about a generally a goodwill activity, right? The commercial side of Handmade Hero is one thing, but the volunteer side of Handmade Hero is quite the other. And when you're talking about people who are voluntarily, for nothing in return, giving some money to support a project, it's pretty important that that happen in a way that people feel good about, because by and large, they are doing it just because they are trying to do a good thing, right? It is a purely altruistic gesture on their part to try and support volunteers who are making something that they like, right? And so I feel like even more so than with a commercial project uh, and, you know, for example, the purchase of Handmade Hero and the source code, right, which goes through SendOwl, even more so than something like that, something that's entirely altruistic or volunteer based or whatever that's, you know, generally based on goodwill, I really don't feel like it can afford to have sort of the cloud of questionability you know, hanging over it. That's not going to give people who contribute money a good feeling about their contribution. And it's also not going to give the people uh, who are just volunteering, who are just trying to get paid for hard work that they're doing, um, you know, a good sort of uh, sheen, right? It's not, it's not painting them with a flattering brush that they're going through this service uh, that is fundamentally pissing people off. I mean, let's just cut to the chase. So again, taking out any sort of ideological or um, uh, economic disagreements you might have or I might have with how they've been doing things or how you specifically feel about these things, I do think that at this point, unfortunately, it's gotten to the point where regardless of anything, it's just not a great service to be a part of. So this letter here that I've got up on the screen is something that I wrote to everyone who has contributed to the Patreon, um, or I guess who is still contributing. I don't, I don't know exactly how Patreon decides who gets a post uh, to a patron's mailing list, but I, I believe it just goes to anyone who's currently subscribed. And basically what I said was, you know, sort of what I just said to you, here's all the great stuff that this has enabled. Um, and hey, Patreon seems like they're imploding right now. And so I'm going to try and figure out an alternative. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. Um, many of the projects that we have supported have already closed their Patreons. Uh, so this is rapidly becoming an issue that will probably have to get resolved this, this weekend. Uh, for example, 4Coder, Alan Webster said he is closing his Patreon. 
Remedy uh, DBG, the um, the debugger project we were starting to support with the Handmade Hero money because we want a replacement debugger for Handmade Hero as well so we can have all open uh, projects running uh, that, that have like been based on essentially like the principles of the series. Uh, I guess open isn't really the important part. It's just uh, based on C++ low-level coding, I guess what you would say. Uh, that one closed. Uh, Abner closed the Handmade Networks Patreon, which was a big one we gave money to. Um, and uh, Miblo, I don't think, has closed his yet. And that's the episode guide one, which was another really big one uh, in terms of contributions for us. But he might, right? Um, and so basically, Patreon has, has imploded with such speed that we have not gotten a replacement in place yet. But I'm going to try and get that up this weekend. So hopefully by Monday, we will have an alternative setup that you can go to if you are a Patreon uh, pledger or want to support the series and are planning on pledging. We're going to open up something else uh, as soon as we possibly can, and we will be closing the Handmade Hero Patreon very shortly, much sooner even than I thought we were going to close it when I wrote this letter. Uh, it probably won't be weeks. It'll probably be days. Um, so I don't have an exact update about that yet. Come tomorrow's Handmade Hero stream, I may have a more concrete uh, solution in place and I can point you to it. But that is what we're working on right now. And so come Monday, I suspect we will have our Patreon closed um, and we will have another option in place for those people who wanted to continue supporting these projects. Um, so yes, long story short, I apologize to everyone who is affected by this. I apologize to the people who have been doing uh, great work to support the many people who learned from Handmade Hero. Uh, making the episode guide, making the drawing package, all of these things, hosting Handmade Network. These things have made a difference to many, many people. Um, and they really made a difference to how people are able to use Handmade Hero as a learning resource. And I apologize to those people who will not be getting this money now because we have to close the Patreon. I apologize to all the patrons who have to deal with this stuff. They were just trying to donate money to, to something they liked. And now they have to worry about this and are, is there pledge being handled properly, what's happening with the service, what's going, right? They don't deserve that either. Uh, so I apologize to everybody. Um, and I will try to fix Patreon's disaster as soon as uh, humanly possible in a way that continues to allow the people who wanted to donate money to continue donating it so that these other projects can continue and be funded. Uh, that's really all there is to say. Uh, I don't have much to say about Patreon's actual problems because I don't think they're super relevant. Um, suffice to say, my personal take was just after reading their explanations of what they were doing in this latest round, I was not particularly convinced already going into it that they were under good leadership. Uh, after reading their latest round of explanations for this particular problem, and given how this particular problem came up, I would say that I have like very little confidence in their leadership in terms of their ability to run a site uh, that does what it's supposed to do and keeps people happy. Uh, so I just think there's not a lot of future there. I think they're probably going away. Uh, and so even if I thought all of the stuff they had done was fine, I probably would still bail on them because I don't think they're going to be around much longer, if that makes sense. So. That's it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, people have been commenting on this thread. Uh, you can go ahead and comment on this thread. If you are a patron you, uh, of the Handmade Hero Patreon, you have gotten this email and it does have a link to this webpage. Uh, but I mean, you can see the URL right here if you want to type it in directly. Uh, so uh, yeah, one five seven eight six eight four seven. that is the post number. Um, so you can go here and comment on this if you'd like to discuss it with other uh, Patreons. Uh, you can also just go to uh, probably a better way is hero.handmade.network. Um, and hero.handmade.network, of course, has our forums on it. There's this forums button right here you can click on. Uh, and if you're on, if you want to comment, you can comment in here uh, anywhere you want. I don't care where you comment on it. We'll move it somewhere uh, reasonable either way put it under game or something. 
uh, and we can talk about it there as well. But either or, I suspect there's not going to have to be uh, much more discussion about it because, like I said, by the end of the weekend, I should have something in place, even if it's only just a mailing list that you can put your name on so that when we have a solution um, come back online, you can come back and pledge if you want. Uh, because once we close the Patreon, which will happen relatively soon, there will no longer be a way for you to uh, direct pledges uh, towards these projects. That's about it. Uh, so anyway, if you have questions about it, like I said, you can come comment here. I will be watching it, uh, or you can put it in the forums, and I'll, I'll try to log in there and check them out. Uh, but that's about it. And uh, it's a lot of people. Like I said, it says you can see right here, it's 158 people. So I'm hoping that everyone got this and everyone understands what's going on. It was more, it was probably 170 or something before this. Lots of people have already canceled their pledges um, and uh, understandably so. So, you know, we will uh, we'll go from here and hopefully nobody is too, um, nobody's project is hurt too hard by this. I feel worse for probably other people out there who were relying on Patreon more uh, for their entire thing. Like a lot of the people who do the handmade hero stuff at least have other irons in the fire. Um, I, I know there's probably people out there who were maybe li even living on their Patreon. I don't know. It, it doesn't tend to generate a huge amount of revenue, but it generates, you know, for some people it generates quite a bit. Uh, I hope those those people's projects aren't destroyed. Um, it's a really bad situation. And I feel like, you know, especially maybe some of the higher money patrons, there's people who make like ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month on Patreon and run an entire business out of it. Uh, it's not many people, but um, I know that, you know, there's, there's plenty of people like, I don't know, Jim Sterling and uh, David Rubin. Uh, there's, there's just people out there who, you know, when you read about Patreon, they're like, hey, here's some people who basically run a studio off of this thing. And I don't know what's gonna happen to those people. I hope they're able to move to something else because it seems like this is going downhill quickly and it won't have a significant effect on Handmade Hero. Um, hopefully it won't have too significant of an impact on the Handmade Hero related projects. But I think there probably are some products out there that are probably in real dire straits because of this. And I, uh, anyway, my heart goes out to those people because I know how hard it is to be doing something you really believe in and to finally have it work out and then have something like this happen. I feel like it's got to be really tough. Uh, so hopefully those people can find some other way to get their Patreons and supporters moved over and that not there's not too much attrition during that process of people just not wanting to have to bother moving their stuff over somewhere else or whatever. So I don't know what will happen, but it's really unfortunate. Anyway, uh, moving off of that sad note uh, onto a neutral note, I have been asked uh, by none other than Miblo, the maintainer of the episode guide, who I was just speaking so highly of, to please mention on stream my chair. Uh, apparently he gets a lot of people asking about the chair or something, and he wanted to get it notated into the episode guide. And I think I've only ever talked about the chair on the pre-stream before, which of course is not kept and is not uh, entered into the video on demand archive. So it cannot be notated. Um, the chairs that we use at Molly Rocket and that I am sitting in right now is the Space Seating Professional Air Grid dark back and padded black eco leather seat, two to one synchro tilt control, adjustable arms with tilt tension, nylon base manager's chair. I do not know why anyone would name a chair that. I probably would have just called it the Space Air Grid chair. And then when I made another chair, I would name it something else. But they did not decide to do that, so there you go. And in case you're wondering about whether you can afford to forget the words Space Seating Professional Air Grid Dark Back and Padded Black Eco Leather Seat, Two to One Synchro Tilt Control Adjustable Arms and Tilt Tension with Nylon Base Manager Chair, Chair. You do have to, because if you accidentally get any of those words wrong, you will probably buy another chair. There are many of these chairs and they are actually quite different. So if for some reason you think you want to buy the exact same chair that we are using, you have to actually buy this one, not one of the other ones also called a space seating professional air grid chair. This is what we use. I quite like them, but chairs are a matter of personal preference. So you may hate them. Also, we don't receive any money from AirGrid. This is a purely what we use and like recommendation. It's not a product placement. I'm just answering the question of what we have. 
In our experience, they're pretty cheap for office chairs because $160 isn't free. There's definitely much cheaper office chairs out there, but there's much more expensive office chairs out there. You can go buy a Herman Miller chair and they can probably run you $1,400 or something like this. Uh, these chairs, on the other hand, I find are better than those chairs. I find them to be much more comfortable, much more supportive, and they're much cheaper. Uh, so this is what we use, and we have a bunch of them here. We've been using them for several years, haven't had any problems. We don't put the arms on. Uh, nobody here likes the arms, um, or I should say perhaps more specifically, nobody here likes having arms on their chairs, really. Uh, so if anything, we either, we don't mount the arms at all most of the time, but other times we mount the arms facing backwards. So there's just a place to lean back and put your elbows if you want, but when you lean forward to work, the arms are not in your way at all. Because uh, you can just flip with the direction. You can see they're sort of tilted forwards. Uh, so that's what we use. Uh, basically armless, the armless version. We don't attach the arms for this chair. Uh, and uh, hopefully that gives Mivlo everything he needs to notate this uh, for people who have questions about the chair. I think that's everything we were supposed to cover at the beginning of the series. That's a lot of front matter. Uh, but hopefully uh, it was useful. And now that we have taken up 30 minutes uh, with preamble, let's go ahead and program. Uh, I believe if I did not reset the timer incorrectly, it is day 413 on Handmade Hero. I will, uh, well, actually, you know, I don't know if the episode guide has been updated yet. Has it? Uh, it has not. Let me take a look at where we're at on the YouTube archive. Uh, we are at day 412, so day 413 is correct. Oops, I don't really need to get rid of that, do I? Let's put it back there. Uh, so we are in day 413, so day 412 source code. If you uh, are someone who pre-ordered the game, day 412 source code is what you want to start with for today. Uh, we are in the middle of trying to debug our basic lighting solution that we've been working on. Uh, so... While we give Visual Studio 17 years to start up, I mean, it's a text editor. After all, it's going to take a long time to load all that important stuff. Let's go ahead and run it and see where we are. I'll also build it first here just to make sure we've got a fresh one. All right. Um, here we go. Uh, so here you can see a completely unlit level. If I hit the F1 key, it will run uh, sort of our lighting solution here and you can see uh, our voxel samples. Uh, these are not actually the samples of lighting, they're just voxel cells where we did compute lighting and it just shows that I think the first or maybe the average of the light in that area, but there's actually many lights per voxel in the area. Uh, anyway, here is what the interpolated lighting solution looks like. As you can see, it's actually starting to get pretty good. Uh, it's not actually good. Yet, it's just getting pretty good, because if you take a look at what we're seeing here, it's sort of starting to look like an actual lighting solution. It's just not a good one yet. There's a lot of bugs I see in here, a lot of things that probably aren't quite right. Uh, and so our job over the next couple sessions, we already did some good debugging. We fixed the voxel interpolation bugs that we had before, where fetching outside the voxel would do something stupid. Um, we already fixed that and it made a huge difference. And now we just need to go through and, and check a bunch of things. A, that we're doing reasonable lighting calculations. B, that our ray casting is actually working properly. We've done no debugging on that so far. For all we know, our ray casting isn't even properly intersecting um, with the boxes that we're trying to intersect with. Uh, and then we have to also make sure that we're doing stuff like handling our light transport um, transmission properly? Are we oversampling? Are we undersampling? Are we weighting samples improperly? Like there's so many things we could be doing wrong. So we're just going to go through now and start tightening up those screws. And once we have them all tightened, hopefully, like I said, this is already kind of starting to look usable, right? Like there's some bugs in it, but it's starting to kind of look usable. And if I was walking around this game and saw real-time lighting doing this good of a bouncing stuff where we had all this sort of light play and all that stuff, I would be pretty darn happy with that, especially for an indie game, which honestly tends to not have that much of that stuff in it. Um, you know, if anything, they've got the default Unity uh, screen space nonsense going on where you got all these weird halos all over the place and, and stuff looks weird. Uh, but anyway, um, so hopefully we'll be able to get to a place uh, that's even that's significantly better than what we're looking at now. And at that point, what we'll do is we'll move it into the GPU so that all of the lighting is computed GPU side uh, after the sort of lighting hierarchy is built. 
So we'll basically build a Lightning hierarchy on CPU, drop it down, let all the Lightning computation happen on the GPU side. Um, and that'll also let us do some things like we can probably control just how much lighting gets actually done. Uh, for example, we could make a fast running version of the game that really doesn't have much lighting at all uh, that we use on platforms that don't have beefy graphics cards, right? Because basically what we could do is just use all of the graphics card, card horsepower, which we don't really need that much for other aspects of the game. We can just do crazy amounts of lighting on there. Uh, and we, then that way we can always just dial it back and have less good lighting uh, in versions of the game that are running on underpowered systems, right? That aren't, aren't running on the latest hardware, which, you know, there's plenty of people who might want to play with Handmade Hero. Um, so that's basically it. I would also point out, I don't know what's going on here, but we we seem to have some weird, like, I don't know, our, our multi-sample anti-aliasing doesn't, oh, is that because we're not full screen? Our multi-sample anti-aliasing could look better I guess it still looks pretty good. Multi-sample anti-aliasing isn't perfect, I guess. And we do have the weird depth pass stuff happening. So it's still, it's pretty good. It's better than nothing, I guess. Uh, anyway, uh, so that's our goals. And today, like I said, all I want to really do is start drilling down into the lighting uh, and hunting for bugs. So that's what we're going to do now. All right. Uh, let's start by taking a look. Uh, in, oh, wait, I don't have to do that. Uh, let's start by taking a look um, at the shader because during the pre-stream someone was mentioning uh, that we forgot to clamp our directional lighting. Now normally you'll notice when I have been doing directional lighting uh, I've been clamping it properly and I guess I forgot to do that. Uh, so let's take a look. Yeah, in fact, here it is, right? They're 100% right. I don't know, you remember many times I've typed in this equation where we do the inner product here to do a directional fall off. And you'll notice that almost every time thereafter, I did a clamp on it, right? And there's no clamp here. Uh, so this is supposed to be clamped and isn't being clamped. So that was 100% correct um, suggestion. We want to clamp between zero and one this fall off. Now, why do we want to clamp it there? Uh, remember what we're doing is we're taking a dot product of two vectors to figure out what the angle between them is. And more specifically what the cosine of the angle between them is, which is the result of the inner product. Now, when a vector, starts going past 90 degrees. It will go from, you know, at 90 degrees, the inner product will be zero. Then it will start becoming negative as they're putting in opposite directions. We don't want to account from, for any kind of negative contribution of light. Once it falls off to zero, that's the end of the possible contribution of that light. Anything coming from behind should not have any contribution at all. It shouldn't have a negative contribution, which is what we would be getting here. So that's a, a definite bug. I don't know to what extent that bug was contributing um, to erroneous actual visible, visible artifacts, but it certainly would have, right? Um, so it's very important to fix that uh, because you never want a contribution there to be negative because you're going to get really nonsensical results, especially if you weren't trying to make it be that way. Um, so anyway, here is, in fact, and you know what? That was a big part of it, it looks like, because we had much more erroneous results down here uh, and now we're getting quite a bit better than we were, right? So it looks like that was definitely a problem uh, that that now has been has been improved dramatically. Uh, and you know what? This is starting to look, like I said, pretty good, right? I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, if we can get this running in real time on the GPU, I think that would be a pretty nice uh, situation. Like, I feel like that would look pretty darn good. Uh, again, I'm just not sure yet, though, whether or not we're... Um, getting reasonable results from things like the Raycaster. Now, why do I say that? Well, you know, if you take a look at what we're seeing here light sample wise, you can see that there's maybe some light samples out here that are showing that they're getting a fairly bright light contribution. Um, but I, I don't feel like that's correct. The reason I don't feel like that's correct is because if you take a look at where our only light source is, this is our, well, we, it's not our only light source. We have two light sources right now. One is just an ambient skylight and one is this light right here. Now I can turn off that ambient skylight. For example, I can go into the render group uh, and we, we sort of just hacked in uh, that when we do our raycast. Uh, here's our raycast. What we did is anytime we were going to return uh, nothing, no hit, we still gave back a color that was slightly, um, you know, a slightly gray color, right? And so what I wanted to do here was just get rid of that, right? I, I uh, if I just, nuke that out and instead give it 
um, nothing, or I guess the shorter hand way to do that would just be initialize to all zeros like this. Um, if I do that instead and now rerun the lighting solution, you can see just the contribution of just this one light. Uh, and when I see just the contribution of just that one light, I can see some things that I don't really know how much I believe whether they are accurate. Some things look quite accurate, such as this back here. This can't, you know, this light source is not going to be contributing to this here. Um, but if you look here, uh, you can see, like, what is that? You know, where is that light coming from? Because there's really no conceivable, even erroneously sampled bounce that should really be able to get here. Because in order for something to get here, something over here would have had to have been bright, and it isn't. So that tells me that we have some bugs in our Raycaster. Because a lot of this looks correct, they're probably not major glaring bugs, but they're subtle bugs. And we need to fix them, otherwise we're constantly going to have these weird little lighting artifacts, right? Uh, so that's, uh, you know, definitely something that clues me into the fact that that Raycaster or something uh, similar to it, where that contribution is getting computed, is wrong. Uh, another thing that I'm seeing here that, that makes me think that there's, you know, some, some issues afoot um, is just that, like, now, you know, even just, just thinking about how this, this uh, procedure was working, uh, in, our, in our transmission, the way that we were doing our transmission uh, for compute light propagation, I'm not sure whether, I, I, when I was thinking about this, this only happens in the final gather. So the skylight part only happens in the final gather. That means our skylight wasn't having bounce lighting before uh, because a skylight lit surface couldn't bounce to another surface. And that's also wrong uh, because if I remember correctly, the way that our light emission works, you can see here we do compute light propagation. What happens with the compute light propagation is in here, if the hit index doesn't happen, then it doesn't propagate any light. And so when it does that raycast, it's never going to sum in any of this ambient lighting during the initial bounces. Uh, so I think what I'm going to do here is ixnay this particular version and say to do uh, need a skylight method that works with our propagation and leave it at that. All right. If you'll excuse me for a moment. Okay. So that's what we're doing. By the way, I'm having some delicious coffee right now. I love coffee. Um, we bought a espresso machine for the office uh, because basically like if you buy, if you like to drink coffee and you buy it from a coffee shop, it is crazy expensive like don't ever do the math if you're someone who gets coffee at a coffee shop don't ever do the math um but we determined that even a relatively expensive coffee machine is drastically cheaper uh than buying coffee out and so we bought one and it's awesome like i just make coffee all the time now like either decaf or regular depending on like in the morning i make a regular and afterwards i make decaf and it's so much cheaper. It's like it turns coffee into basically being free all of a sudden. Because all you have to do is find beans you can buy at a reasonable price that you like. And then you're done, right? Um, so, yeah, sorry Starbucks uh, or other folks who live off of the overpriced coffee economy. I got to tell you, it's the way to go. Plus, you can tune it to your own liking. Like, you can make exactly what you want over time, which as programmers, you know, we kind of like to fixate on improvements to things. It's pretty darn good. All right. Anyway, uh, so yeah, let's take a look here and think about um, some stuff that we haven't really addressed yet that we're probably going to need to address. So what we're looking at here, right, this is our Raycast um, this, this is the code that, that does our rate casting, right? So we're calling this, and it's looping through all of the elements in the system, and it's skipping one person who is generally the person that we're looking at. Um, so if we're like, okay, this is a surface we need to light, and that's the person we're looking at right now, and now we wanna go gather lighting, 
we skip intersections with that surface. And the reason that we skip intersections with that surface is because we would always intersect it. We're on it, we're starting off on it. So floating point precision wise, we would have to do something like offset ourselves from the surface a little bit to make sure that we don't hit it or something like this. And we'd really rather not, right? Like we'd really rather not have to do that sort of thing. Um, so anyway, uh, what we can see here is when we do our intersections, you'll notice that one thing that we do is we don't hand, um, we don't intersect back faces. And what I mean by that is if the ray direction is pointing uh, in the same direction as the surface, we don't test it. Uh, and you know what, let me go ahead and bring up Milton here. It's been a while uh, since we have brought up Milton, uh, but I think now is the time, if I can get this cord untangled, uh, to bring it up. Okay. Um, so let me go ahead and, and fire up Milton here for you, uh, and then we can discuss this aspect of it a little bit. Um, Milton, again, one of those projects I mentioned at the beginning of the stream, uh, written by viewer of Handmade Hero who uh, wanted to replace a drawing package we used, ended up making something that's actually significantly better than the commercial project that we were using originally, which is nuts, um, but nice job, Sergio. Anyway. Uh, here we are on day 13. Uh, Sergio, by the way, I think recently said he was moving to Vancouver. Uh, I, that's pretty nearby. I feel like that's in um, in uh, just the, the southwestern part of Canada, just not far from Seattle. It's like a three, four hour train ride up there, actually. Uh, anyway, day 413. Uh, here is our Raycast debugging. Uh, and anyway, so what I'm saying is, you know, we've got a surface here and there's a point on the surface. We're starting to collect lighting by casting rays out, right? Or we have an emitter here, right? So this is a light and it's shining light out and it wants to see where it should deposit that light, right? Either or, when we're doing this ray casting, uh, generally what we're assuming is that our shapes are closed, right? So we're assuming we have like a solid shape like this. And that what we're doing is when we raycast, when we raycast out, we don't need to look at this face or this face for intersections. And the reason that we don't need to is because we know we couldn't have gotten to them without passing through one of these non back faces, or I should say non same direction facing. I don't know how to say that exactly um, first. So if we take a look at these normals, these surface normals, right? If we take a look at those, what we can see is that this plane, right? I will always hit here, which is a normal that's facing backwards towards me, right? Before I can hit any of these ones that are facing away from me, right? And that's just because if you take a look at how this object is divided, all of its faces that are facing toward me form a wall of what I can see and any face that's facing away from me is something I couldn't have gotten to unless I passed through the object first. And that's just a property of closed solids. If you have a completely closed solid, which is any object generally in the real world, you know, there's no such thing, even things that are open on the inside, they're actually not open, right? They have a thickness and they have walls going all around them, right? Uh, you can't get to something that's on the back side of something to you without going through something that's on the front side of something to you, right? If you imagine just a ball or something, right? I can never get to any of this part of the ball, right? None of this part of the surface without going through this part of the surface first, right? That's just a property of closed solids. So it's one way to eliminate the number of triangles that you need to test, or in our cases, quads that you need to test you can eliminate it by a factor of two, right? 50% of the surfaces to us will probably be back facing and 50% will be front facing. We only need to test those 50% that are front face, that face towards us, right? Now, in case you're wondering, this is 100% exactly analogous to the old hidden surface removal, removal algorithm or even just what we use nowadays to speed up rendering. Nowadays, when we render surfaces, a lot of times we just don't render back faces. So what happens is, uh, you know, for example, if we've got a, a solid object in the world, right? 
So we're drawing like a cube or something like this. There's back faces to the cube, right? Here's our front faces, one, two, three. And then we've got our back faces, one, two, three, right? What we do when we render typically in a rasterizer is look to see how the polygons are wound. And what we'll say is, well, okay, we're gonna wind our polygons so that when we are looking from the front side like this, uh, we're gonna wind them so they're counterclockwise, right? So here's zero, one, two, three, right? <coughs> that means that if you were to imagine this cube being spun all the way around, so that now that was a back face, right? So imagine this cube being spun 180 degrees so that now we've got sort of a back face there. Now, they wouldn't be wound this way anymore, right? This, this direction is not how they'd be wound because that's what it was wound when it's facing us. Instead, they'll be wound this way. They'll be wound clockwise, right? Because this vertex went here, so there's zero, right? This vertex went here, right? Because it spun around, right? These were spinning around, so this is one went over here, the zero went over here, right? So now it's zero, one, two, three, clockwise. So what we can then do is when we go to rasterize and we look at this quad, we can go, oh, it's wound the wrong way. It must be back facing, just don't rasterize it at all. And so again, that's a 50% save it, right? It saves half of the work because we never have to rasterize those, right? So this is the same technique that I'm using here during the raycast is the same thing you use in a rasterizer to save that work. It's just a good 50% savings to realize that if you're only dealing with closed objects, you don't have this problem. Now, we don't always have closed objects in Handmade Hero. We've got sprites, right? And those sprites are just little sprite cards, right? That's all they are. They don't have a solid shape. And basically what I'm electing to do is I am electing to say when we send down the lighting for this, because remember, we're gonna send down lighting separately. Lighting is, is based on these light quads, which are not the same as what we're drawing. We don't, they're com they can be completely separate. Because remember, we're sampling lighting per pixel now. We don't care what we draw. We can draw a completely different scene from the one we lit. Wouldn't make any sense, not a good idea, but we could. There's no coupling in the algorithm. So we can generate a completely different lighting model as we do for a render model. And this was 100% intentional on my part because we probably want to send down much more simplified stuff to our lighting solution than we do to our rendering solution because we only need a coarse idea of what the lighting is for this game. We don't need every last little detail to be respected in the lighting. We're just going for a general sort of light transmission that lets us know how lit things generally are. This is not a game that's trying to simulate little minute differences in the light based on little tiny crenellations and geometry or something like this. And in fact, no games are because games can't do that yet. We don't have the horsepower, but that's neither here nor there. That's more of Ray Tracer land if you're going down that route. But uh, point being, because of that, I'm just saying, look, if we want an object to be uh, sucking up light properly for being in a particular area, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna send down two things on either side of the sprite card. So if you imagine looking at the game from here, here's the camera, and we've got a sprite card here that's the hero, it's facing that way. We're just gonna send down two fake light things. One this way, one that way, so it's like a sandwich where the hero's actual sprite would have been in between. And that way we don't have to ever worry about dual-sided surfaces. I just decided it was too much of a pain in the butt to track them through and probably just going to end up being more costly and slower to do so. So we'll just, for those things that are just flat cards, we'll send down two things. Anything that's a real piece of geometry, like the cubes, they will just get sent down as actual closed geometry. And that way, all whenever we're working with these things, we can just understand the fact that we only care about front-facing stuff, right? And that should be sufficient for our purposes. So here's that code right here. And you can see that what it's doing is it's taking that inner product and going, hey, look, if the normal is not pointing back towards me, then I'm not going to use it, right? Now, I don't really know why uh, we necessarily picked this constant. I think we probably just picked it um, randomly as something that would make our divide not blow up because you can kind of see that uh, we have a divide here by that raised source end and we have to make sure that it doesn't blow up. Now, why do we have to make sure um, of that right there. Well, that's because when we do our ray cast, right? If we're ray casting in this direction, so here's our, our ray origin, uh, and here's our ray direction. If we're casting in this direction, you have to remember there are services we cannot hit. 
we can't hit anything that's perpendicular, for example, right? This ray will just sail on by, and no matter if it went infinity or negative infinity, it doesn't matter, it will never hit it. That's what this is, because the inner product of these two things will be zero, and that means ray source n will be zero, and the math is telling us this, right? The math is telling us that is not allowed. It's one of those nice places where the math works out to tell you things you should have known already, but even if you forgot or didn't understand, the math will then tell you. And you're like, oh, there's a divide here. That means there could be a divide by zero. That means zero is not allowed. That means almost universally when you have that in a geometric construction, that there's some geometric scenario that literally can't happen, and it's telling you that, right? And that is exactly what that is. What, uh, it's kind of cool, right? All right, so, it's, so what we decided to do here was rather than just test for an epsilon, which means, hey, let's see if it's close to zero. And if it's close to zero, we don't do it. We actually said, look, we're gonna test for an entirely one-sided thing. Because again, let's not bother testing those things because you could see if we were trying to just avoid just, just to divide by zero, right? We would have something that looked more like this, right? We just wanna make sure that it was within uh, you know, or, or that it wasn't within a certain range of zero. But instead what we're doing is saying, hey, look, positive values, we just don't want ever, right? We don't want, we don't care how close to zero they are, just, they're bad. And the reason for that is, again, we would be testing services we know we can't hit. So far from being a bug that's actually good, <coughs> that's what we want to see. So that's fine. Uh, so uh, that is reasonably logical. We then take our origin here. Uh, we take the ray origin and we, we create uh, essentially a, uh, a thing which points from the thing we're checking, the, the surface we're checking, back towards the ray, back towards the ray's origin, right? So what we're doing here uh, is we're just saying, okay, here's my ray origin. Here is the surface. We're calling this source. I think that's because we just copied it. It's just a thing we're trying to hit. And what we're doing here is we're saying, all right, there's a point on this plane. We know because we made one, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, let's create the vector that points back in this direction. Now you'll notice it's the actually the full vector. So it's not a normal or anything, it's a full vector going all the way from here to here, right? What we then do is say, let's take the pr dot product of the normal that we do have from our surface and this, or this, this vector going this way, right? So we're taking this um, as a dot product, right? Uh, which means it's sort of computing this uh, cosine here, right? So it's computing the, oops, that's not right. Computing the cosine, that's the sine. That's the cross product right there. This is the dot product. Uh, so we're taking the cosine of this angle here, and then we're multiplying it by the length of this vector, right? Because remember, I've said this so many times, please tell me you know what I'm gonna say right now. Please tell me you know what I'm gonna say. Tell me you know. Uh, a transpose B equals length of A, length of B, cosine theta. I, if, if there is anyone who has been watching Handmade Hero the entire way through, who doesn't know this equation, I do not know what to say to you. I am going to have to just get a white glove and slap it right across your face because this is so important and we've talked about it so many times. Again, that's exactly what's happening here. We know we have one vector that's a normal. We're, we're taking one thing out of the equation, right? Because we know one of this, this right here, this normal, the length of the normal is one. So one of these goes away. That leaves us with the cosine of theta, which is this right here, times the length of B, which is this vector right here. So that's exactly what we're getting. We're getting the cosine of this angle times the length of this vector, right? Then what we're doing is we're taking whatever that was, we're negating it, and dividing it by uh, this inner product that we got um, back here, right? And what that's doing is that's computing a ratio, right, between the two, uh, uh, between the two directions. It's creating a ratio between this and this, right? And what that's trying to do is figure out how long it will take for something going in this direction to cover something that needs to go all the, that, that, to intersect with something that is going in this direction, 
right? It's like this plane, depending on where you're going to be, is going to be at a different place depending on how far you've gone this way, right? And so that ratio there is what we're computing with T ray, right? And that's going to tell us how far along this we have to go before we hit this place. So then we say is R8, if we got a intersection that's in front of us, and remember uh, the reason that in front of us is important is because uh, when we solve these equations, we're solving these equations con con uh, continuously with regular continuous math. And what continuous math does when, you know, everything that you ever did in grade school and high school and whatever else, right? Uh, probably most of college is always in continuous math. It's not in discrete math. And what that means is that when we solve an equation, right, TA plus P equals five or whatever, right? When we solve equations that look like these, uh, what we end up doing is we end up solving for a real value or a potentially even imaginary value of T, right? But it's a real or imaginary value, continuous. It doesn't have the notion of bounding planes or step functions or anything like this. So what that means is when we solve this equation, it's really not solving for a ray, it's solving for a line, right? So it may produce a T value that's representative of backwards. T can be negative, right? So T could equal negative something, right? And we don't want to know that. If there's something behind us, that doesn't count. We're trying to look in the forward direction only. So this is the place where we clip that out. So we say, all right, if the intersection is going to be in front of us and it's closer than our closest hit, so we don't have to go as far as the closest hit we've recorded so far, then what we're going to do is we're going to see whether or not we believe it to fall within the legal region of this particular hit, right? Because remember, we're not trying to just intersect planes, we're trying to intersect squares, like little like rectangular bounds, right? Okay. So the next thing we do is say, all right, let's find out where we actually are in the real world. So we take this ray uh, position um, computation and we say, start at the origin, go out along the normal as far as you said you needed to go to get to this hit. We do that, right? We then look and say, all right, take the inner product of this ray, right? Whatever um, this, this ray position, take the inner product of that with our source axes. Okay, um, and what you'll notice here is the relative origin part is pretty important because the relative origin part means we've already centered ourselves around the source, right? That's why we're using this vector, this relative origin here, rather than the original ray origin is because we want the result of stepping along this ray to still be in the space of this, right? We want it to be centered around this, why? because our square is defined around there, right? If this is our source P, right? Uh, we've got a square that's defined by an X axis and a Y axis emitting from that point. And when we compute where the ray ends up, we want it to be relative to this. We want a vector relative to this because only if it's relative to that can we then directly dot product it with our axes to find out where it is. So here we go, we do this. We dot product with our x-axis and our y-axis. That tells us where it is relative to them. Why we do 2.0, I believe, is because of the way we've stored these, right? Uh, so if you think about what happens here, this uh, x check and y check, it's is it greater than or equal to the width, uh, greater than, less less than or equal to the width, you know, negative width, uh, positive width. Well, what happens here is the width it would really be half the width here. So rather than divide the width by half in both cases, I just multiply the X check by two once, right? And that's it. So that's all there is to it. We check to see whether it's within those bounds. And if it is within those bounds, we do consider it a hit and off we go, right? We record it as the closest hit so far because we know we couldn't have gotten here unless we already determined it was the closest hit. Uh, we then say which one it was and what its emission value was, like so, uh, so that it can go back to the uh, calling code correctly. And that's all she wrote. Um, so to me, that looks like a pretty stable uh, ray cast. There could be a bug lurking in there, but it doesn't. There's not an obvious one. Um, so basically. 
I'm not super suspicious of that code specifically. However, just because I'm not suspicious of that specific code doesn't mean we couldn't still have a bug in the way that we're calling the raycast. For example, we don't know if all of these values are set correctly. So there could be a bug lurking in here. We don't know. Um, and we don't know, the other thing we don't know is, is there a bug lurking in where we set these? For example, could the x-axis and y-axis have been set wrong? Could the width and height have been set, set wrong? Um, those are things that easily could happen, which would cause a bug uh, in what we are doing, right? Uh, so there's all that. Now, there's another um, uh, There's another thing that we could be doing wrong here too, right? So when we say which thing to skip, for example, we could be saying that wrong. Uh, when we call this right, we could be calling it with the wrong information in terms of when we're trying to propagate that light, you know, are we passing the right index here or whatever. I think we probably are, it'd be pretty hard to get that wrong, I think. But again, there's like all those sorts of things could be going wrong in the trappings of this code that would make it so even if our Raycast was rock solid and we determine there's no actual bugs uh, that are really manifesting themselves here, that doesn't mean that we don't have some kind of a problem uh, with how we're using the code that is itself, you know, causing this issue, right? Similarly, we also don't know about how we generate our raycast. So for example, if you take a look at this code right here, um, where we do uh, compute light propagation or the same code here in gather final lighting, uh, this is a thing that's supposed to distribute stuff uh, across the hemisphere. It's a pretty janky one right now. Um, but basically this thing, which is generating, um, uh, how should I say this? Uh, this piece of code is, is trying to generate uniform samples about a hemisphere, but it's just doing a horrible job at it. What it does is it starts at the normal and just adds a random negative one to one value in each of the uh, various directions, right? Um, and the thing about that is, I feel like in fact, just thinking about this, this could be completely bogus, right? Um, because there we go. Uh, because let's suppose that we have a normal, right? In fact, let's do, yeah, let's do this case. So let's suppose we have a normal. Now we know that this is our normal and this is, you know, a normal of length one, uh, cause that's what a normal is and all of our normals are normalized. Uh, so what that means is this here, this length here is one. Uh, but for example, right, uh, if we were to take this axis like this, right, um, these would not be one, right? <clears throat> uh, so these would be less than one, right? And this right here in theory can't be more than one though, because if this, uh, I'm sorry, this right here has to be more than one because if this we know is one, right? Then by just principles, basic principles of right triangles, we know that this has to be longer than one because the hypotenuse of a triangle, of a right triangle, um, well, of any triangle, the hypotenuse, you know, uh, is the longest side. That's the definition of hypotenuse, right? Uh, in a right triangle, we know that neither of the two sides that are um, part of the right, part of the 90 degree, uh, that connect to it, those sides have to be both shorter than the hypotenuse, hypotenuse right? Um, so we know that that's always gonna be greater. The same would be true on the other side, right? Um, so I think, I'm trying to trying to guess, but I think that means that if we were to add negative one in this direction or negative one in this direction, right? We would not risk moving our normal in an errant way. However, let's suppose we added both because there's nothing in here that disallows that, right? What that would mean is that we would be pointing potentially negative one in this direction, let's say that got us here, and negative one in this direction, let's say that got us here. We would be pointing back out the back side of the surface, right? And that's simply, erroneous. So what will end up happening is if we, you know, if we look at something like this, um, what will end up happening is we're only supposed to be casting this direction out of a surface. We might end up casting this direction. Since we're not considering back faces, which are these, we'll sail right through the other side of the object and pick up light 
that's transmitting through the other side of the object. And hey, by the way, right, that's exactly what looks like it's happening in the thing that I was complaining about, right? That, that is the exact kind of thing that could be happening right there. I don't know that that's what's happening, but it would be consistent with it. So that's starting to raise my spidey senses, which I don't have because I'm, I'm not a spider man of any kind. Um, but it's starting to just make me a little bit, you know, nervous. So I feel like maybe the first order of business in this debugging process, because we know that this is crappy, right? When we put it in here, we knew it was crappy. Um, so maybe the first order of business is let's improve this and try to make one that's actually not going to be super puggy, right? Uh, and we don't have to improve it much. We don't need a really great lighting solution here. We're not trying to capture perfect light or anything. We just need something that's going to do a good hemisphere sample without totally screwing it up, which it might be doing at the moment. So I'm going to make an internal here. Um, and this is going to be called like, uh, you know, sample hemisphere. Uh, and I'm just going to give it a normal and, a, and uh, one of those random series. Uh, and then I'm going to just copy this code right here. And the first thing I'm going to do is, again, just make literally the exact um, function we were already using in both places, like so. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these two places we were calling it and just replace them with that call, right? So just prepare ourselves to replace this function at, ser oops, at series uh, emit n. Like so. And at series test n. So those should basically do exactly the same thing. So if we call it now, we should get the exact same lighting solution we were getting before. Um, because again, remember, although these are random numbers, they're pseudo random numbers, we're using the same. Uh, random series every time so we should get basically the same results unless something weird happened and you can see we're still getting that weird light bleed although it looks slightly different this time I don't know it could be that uh, the way these functions are compiled compile them in a different order as well uh, so there is a little bit of that right <clears throat> but either way um, so if we uh, want to improve this function we were taking a normal and we want to sample a hemisphere around it um, there's a lot of different things we could do. I'm not sure what we want to do uh, in terms of improvements here. But uh, yeah, like the very first thing we could do is just reduce the numbers that we're adding to make sure that it can never add more than a normalized amount, right? Um, so for example, <clears throat> a really simple way to prevent the backwards facing problem would be to say something like, all right, we know we've got an equation of the form um, x squared plus y squared plus z squared square rooted, this is the length of the thing we're adding. And we know that since we've got a unit vector in a particular direction, if we want to make sure that it can never point in the opposite direction ever, we could just make sure that the vector we add to it can never be more than the amount that would get you to like right here, right? So it always has to be sort of this direction. Now that's not great because it does mean as well um, that we would never be able to really get really glancing angles. Um, but that's probably okay because we don't really want angles in that direction very much, right? Um, because we're mostly concerned about light that's coming in from here. Because as it gets coming into here, since this is a diffuse reflectance model, this is not specular, uh, we really don't want to count these contributions because the cosine falloff term will knock them out to a large extent, right? <clears throat> For specular, that's not true. Specular, there's a high bounce rate at uh, glancing angles. Um, that's a kind of another lighting thing we can go down at some point, but that's not for this sort of radiosity-ish kind of feeling bounces. So we know that we're basically doing this. Uh, and so if we want to make sure that this thing can never put us back in the wrong direction, what we could say is we want it to equal some value, like, you know, 0.9, right? So we're always, we never quite get all the way back. So we could say we want, you know, the length of the vector we generate 
uh, to look like this. Now, how would we solve this? Because, you know, we got three unknowns and one equation is not going to go very far, right? Uh, the answer is yes, it is going to go very far because we know that each of these is generated uniformly, right? We're, we're treating each of them the same. So really what we're doing here is we're just creating three values that each could be of a certain magnitude. So if they're all the max magnitude, let's call that m, what we would have is m squared plus m squared plus m squared, right? Otherwise known as 3m squared. So 3m squared, square rooted, has to be, you know, 0.9. That would tell us what our m could be, what the maximum range is for the thing that we're plug putting in, positive or negative, right? So we can solve this, right? 0.9 equals root 3 times root m squared. Now that simplifies pretty nicely, right? 0.9 equals root 3 times m, uh, and that just means that 0.9 over root 3 equals m, right? Unless it's, you know, it's a, you know, kind of a slow start today on Handmade Hero. So, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm uh, getting too rusty there, but it seems like we could do 3 uh, square rooted. Uh, oops, uh, how do I commit? I don't know how to use this program at all. I want to divide 0.9 by that. Uh, well, you know what I could do? I could divide this by 0.9 and then invert it. Can it do that? Of course it can't. Of course it can't do that. <sighs> it's Microsoft. They don't do math there, apparently. No matter how big I make this, I never get any buttons I actually want. There it is. There it is right there. Uh, so it looks like around 0.5. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so let's find out if that's true. So let's try 0.5 times 0.5, right? Uh, and so that would what we'd have under, and if we times that by three, we get 0.75, right? Um, and if we do the square root of that, we get roughly 0.9. So that's pretty close. So that, that seems like basically what we want. Um, so we know here, if we were to just set these, uh, all of these, to only be able to take a max range of 0.5, we know we would be safe. Now, is this great? No, right? This is definitely to do, you know, better hemisphere sampling. Is this going to stop the bad backcasting situation? If this was the cause of it, yes, um, hopefully. So uh, now let's take a letting sample and see where we're at. Um, let's take a look at those back surfaces. Uh, and it looks to me like there's still a little bit of badness in there. Maybe it's hard to say. Um, we didn't have much of glaring errors necessarily. We've kind of got some in here. That doesn't look good to me. Although I don't know how much of that is an interpolation error. It's a little hard to say. Um, one thing it would be nice to do is have better visualization here of these values. Um, trying to think if there's any way we could really uh, do that. Because see, one of the problems that we have is this is not a good vis this right here is not really a useful visualization and the reason it's not a useful visualization is because this is also getting passed through the lighting right so we need to set the lighting equal to all ones in order to really make that work right uh, but anyway so let me move i'm going to move the hero around a little bit or more importantly the light source that's attached to the hero at the moment um, and i just want to see what i get uh, in terms of backlighting there uh, or lighting that, that punches through. Uh, and the other thing I could do is, uh, let's try to increase that lighting intensity as well. So if I go into uh, the world mode and we set that uh, lighting there, uh, we've got that add piece uh, light situation. Um, I don't think we're actually using that though. Yeah, for the snake segments, we're not actually using that. I believe we're just adding a light manually. Um, let me double check that that's true. Yeah, it's right here. Um, so here's that, that light call uh, that's going into the render group. Uh, and you can see, oops. Uh, and you can see here where that emission value, it's that, that final one. So it's, it's this guy right here. Uh, so we can, if we want to, just crank that emission value up. These are unitless right now. Like we don't have a particular idea of what that unit is. It's just a, a light strength. So you can see if I if I jack it up quite a bit, um, 
you know, it's going to bounce more light around from, uh, from this particular position. Uh, and so that can help us find bugs because if I just keep increasing that light, I can really blow out the amount of light that's going through there and hopefully we'll see any errors will stand out more significantly. That doesn't really look like it increased the lighting values all that much though. Is that just me? Correct me if I'm wrong, but that just doesn't look that bright compared to what it was. I wonder if we've got another bug in there. Yeah, it seems like we're kind of clamping out at a maximum brightness there, right? Um, because the brightness value obviously is doing something. Like if we compare this value here uh, to this value here, it got brighter, but it didn't get much brighter, right? So that value is definitely clamping out. And I assume that's because when we send down those light values, those must be the brightest light values we can send. That doesn't make sense though. That's definitely not, right? Um, although now that I think about it, if our light values are always ca capped, and this is kind of a problem that we would have to work out, right? Like if we take a look at how we're sending these down, uh, our lighting values that we're sampling We do have a problem here, which is that this is where our light value is coming in, right? It's, it's a, it's just going to be an 8-bit value. Uh, so I feel like maybe what we would want to do there is use that extra parameter to encode a greater brightness amount or something like this, right? Uh, you know, maybe something that's a multiplier on the values of the light uh, after the fact or something like this. Um, <clears throat> trying to think of how we would do that in some way that made sense. Um, so let's take a look at what these values are actually saying. I assume that lighting texel, which is this D, uh, value right here is probably going to be fully encoded. So looking at this value, we've got RGB and A. We're currently not using A. So it would kind of be like a HDR encoding problem where it's like, hey, can you, is there anything really all that useful you can do uh, with that final value? Uh, and maybe we can, like maybe we can make that be like it's an RGB and an exponent kind of a thing, uh, right? Like that's something we could do. Um, but that that almost certainly is the problem. So just to just to make that a little more concrete, if we take a look at what happens in render group here, when you compute all the lighting, those lighting samples, I mean, they're actually samples of lighting values, right? Uh, which can be arbitrarily high. Like there's no cap on the number of photons, you know, that there's probably some physical limit on the number of photons, but it's going to be in the like billions and billions. It's a sun, right? Like, you, you know, like that's how bright you could be. That's how much. Um, so it's certainly not like a zero to one clamped range like that. It doesn't make a, a lot of intuitive sense there. And you can see why. Uh, so when we come through here and we're like taking the incident light, you can see this clamp zero to one. That's where we're losing all that light information, right? Uh, and so what we might want to do is just figure out a way we can uh, get that value to be more reasonable in terms of encoding the, the information we care about. Now, I don't know exactly how to do that, but let's just take a random crack at it. What if instead when we encoded this lighting value, what we said was something more like, all right, let's take the incident light RGB um, and we'll see how big it is, right? Uh, so we'll say, all right, let's take the length of the element incident light RGB, right? And that will tell us how much light power there is behind this particular light sample. Uh, then what we'll do is we'll normalize to that, right? 
Uh, so we'll say if light power is greater than zero, because remember there might be no light power here at all. Uh, but if light power is greater than zero, uh, and you know we can also say infinite light equals nothing. Uh, if the light power is greater than zero, then what we'll do is say, okay, in that case, the incident light, we won't do the clamp zero to one. Instead, what we'll do is we'll do a clamp zero to one uh, on the light power, like so. Uh, and then we'll use the normalized version of uh, the, the light itself. So we'll basically say like the light color equals uh, the... Uh, incident light RGB divided by uh, the light power, right? Like that. Uh, so then we can just say light color R, light color G, light color B. Uh, and then we just need to clamp only the light power because we know that the, only the light power could really be out of range, right? Now we could, if we wanted to be safe, we could do these anyway, just to make sure they don't get a little over one after the normalization, if there was a little bit of error, right? Um, but otherwise, you know, we wouldn't really even have to do this theoretically, right? So then all we have to do is say, well, this light power, so now we know it could be from zero to one uh, is one way to interpret it, but now we could say we want lights up to a much higher power potentially than that, right? So maybe we want lights up to a power of like 10 or something like this. I'm not sure. Um, and so if we want lights that go up to, to much higher powers uh, than one, what we could do here is say, uh, all right, let's say that our light power can range up to 10. So when we, before we do the clamp here, uh, what we'll say is we'll just nuke it by light power, right? And we could even make this be a thing that you could actually uh, specify specifically. Uh, such as max light power and, you know, it's 10, right? Uh, and in that case, if we specified it there, what we could do is say, well, the light power is going to be divided by the max light power, and that's how it's going to be encoded. Later on, when we actually specify these values uh, and interpret them in the shader, what we will now get is when we fetch the light color, we now have four values. And when we actually get that uh, light C RGB, what we need to do here is multiply by the power first, right? So that light color is now gonna be light C RGB multiplied by light color eight, but back in the power, multiplied by the max light power because that's what amps that alpha value up to its correct value, right? Uh, and so in here, then we would say, all right, when we're actually, you know, putting this information down, we need to be able to specify here, you know, some of these constants, right? So we also want a uniform here. <clears throat> Actually, we don't need a uniform. This can just be, because this is fixed at compile time. We can actually just have here, you know, max light power equals some floating point value, whatever that floating point value is. Um, and then we can just say, <clears throat> that'll get included, right? Uh, I'm not sure why RGB isn't in there. Oh, because incident light, I guess, is just an RGB already. Yeah. Uh, all right, so, you know, that's one way to encode this stuff. Uh, we got to recompile the shaders as well, so I'll just do a full build there instead of leaving that open. Um, <clears throat> and so now, uh, if we did that correctly, <clears throat> doesn't look like we did, um, if we get this working correctly, we should be able to have more light power uh, involved. That just looks weird. Uh, probably because it's using it as an actual alpha value at that point, right? Yeah, that's because this is the, the light power is the alpha value in this scenario, right? Uh, so it looks like we're doing the colors wrong there. Let me see what I messed up. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so if I take a look at what's going on here, I've got uh, the light colors RGB. It's divided by the light power, which should be the length of the incident light incoming. Um, oh, that's very simple. It's element incident light 
we were not using the actual, we were using the thing that we were going to accumulate into. Uh, that's not going to work very well. Um, so now we can have much more powerful lights uh, illuminating our scene. And you can see there the result of that is sort of already uh, instantly uh, noticeable. Now, I don't know whether we're doing that correctly here, but hey, for a thousand light, that's probably true. Uh, let's go ahead and recompile back to a light of one. Uh, and there you can kind of see, uh, you know, it honestly, it's already sort of looking like it's a little bit better at recording how much light was hitting that surface. Although I don't know if that's accurate or not. Um, but now if we up the light power to two, we should be able again to sort of get a, uh, yeah, a more, more light falling on that surface. And that does look like what we're getting. Um, so that's good. That allows us to encode it. And you can see that it's doing exactly what I wanted. We can see our light leaking here much more clearly now than we used to. So now I can just blow this light out really violent, right? <clears throat> Not something we'd ever want to happen in the actual game, but perfect for looking for our lighting errors. And we've got a lot of them you can kind of see here, right? Um, we've got a, a lot of different kinds of things that seem to be happening. So you can see light leakage here. Not sure why light is able to get here so effectively, right? And more importantly, red light. So I'm not sure why this is able to see this so well. Uh, similarly, you know, you can see um, on the undersides of surfaces, we've got a lot of light leaking through there. And what's really interesting about that, um, <clears throat> uh, you can sort of see like, well, that's kind of cool. Uh, anyway, uh, you can sort of see that, you know, this may be a case of just the sampling being bad. Uh, like for these surfaces right here, you know, is it just that it's picking up the light samples that were coming from here? Um, is that where that's coming from, you know? And I don't know. Uh, so a lot of that stuff is just really kind of a little bit confusing. Some of it may actually be right. Like, you know, some of this light may just be bounce light coming from here, which is legitimately coming from there, right? Um, so it's pretty hard to say what's definitively a bug. That's one of the problems with lighting is some of the effects are pretty subtle. So you don't always know that something is actually wrong or right. Um, you have to just kind of uh, construct test cases and guess, right? But what I'm doing now is we're first just doing this debugging. Uh, what I'd like to do here is I'd like to focus on some things that look very wrong. Now this right here looks very wrong to me, that right there. Uh, the reason that looks very wrong to me is there should be all kinds of zero samples here. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Um, and in fact, if I look at, um, I guess I just, we got to set those. <clears throat> Let's change that uh, light interpolation interpretation so I can actually see better what's going on there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so let's go ahead and, uh, oh, you know what else I should do <clears throat> while we're at it? When we are sampling that hemisphere, uh, let's just add an assertion so we can double check <clears throat> that the direction we pick times the normal we started with is always greater than zero because we never want it to go backwards, right? <clears throat> Uh, and so that's an important thing that we just want to make sure we never do, right? Uh, and so if I run this now, we should get an assertion there if we ever head back in the wrong direction. Okay. Uh, so what I wanted to say before is like, okay, so when we output the debug lighting, uh, that's this code right here. And um, uh, no, it's not. It's a lie. It's this this code right here. Um, you can kind of see what we're doing is we go through here and we look at the lighting texels and we see what we've got for colors and we just accumulate all of the light that's in there, right? Um, one of the things we do is we then divide by the count. So we're taking an average of the light in that area, which is fine. What I would like to do, however, in this case, is I'd like to say, uh, you know what? Let's make sure that when we do this, let's interpret that alpha value correctly. So when we do the RGB unpack here, um, right? 
uh, where we do the RGB unpack 4x8. Uh, let's just take that unpack. And before we actually do anything to it, uh, let's actually make sure we're uh, undoing the power part, right? So let's take a V3 color here. Um, I guess actually we could do a V4 color that just defaults to one alpha, something like that, right? Let's do that unpack and then let's do the unpack RGB times equals the max light power times unpack A, right? Just take that power back uh, and just put it back in there, right? Uh, so now we can see those values a little bit better. Uh, why are we still getting alpha there? That's weird. Oh, because we're dividing by the count. Uh, so we need to do this part only in terms of the RGB. Oops, I didn't mean to actually close. Doesn't matter. Um, so here we can see our samples again, right? Uh, so what I'd like to do is let's just take a look uh, at, for example, this area back here, which is getting very strongly lit for like no reason at all uh, that would make sense in the actual scene. And let's take a look at what those values are in there, right? Uh, and what you can kind of see is that it does look like the lighting sample in that area is heavily red, right? Um, But those are the front side faces. These are the back side faces right here, and there's no light in them. So I guess it's just a question of interpolating between the two that's the issue. I'm not sure. Uh, one question I do have is what would happen if we were to increase our voxel size, uh, our, our voxel resolution at this point? We had dropped it down pretty far. Uh, just because we were trying to get more interpolation, but I think we've sort of addressed some of the reasons that we had wanted that. I would interested to know if our lighting solution gets more useful um, if we drop it back down, right? Um, and, you know, what you can see here is we got rid of some of the artifacts that I, like those back interpolation artifacts look like that is what they those potentially were. I don't know about those necessarily. Um, but we get some really weird other artifacts there, right? Which is these here are still seeing through um, to the blue light. Now, there are some reasons why that could be happening legitimately, but I think those are going to be more excuses than anything else. Um, if, for example, the lighting sample was taken in here and up to there, uh, and that's what was getting counted, then maybe. But let's take a look at where it actually is. Um, yeah, you can kind of see that the sample is right there. Uh, and so I don't really know. what. Let's just do an experiment to figure out to what extent the placement versus what it has to go through is affecting that raycast. Because what we can do is we can take and make this two-sided. So if raise source n uh, is on either side of this, right? Now we will collide against back faces as well. Uh, and so we could see what ends up happening if we make the raycast work in a two-sided fashion. We can see whether we still have that light leakage. And it looks like we do, right? Um, oddly enough, it looks like we have different likely light leakage though when we do that. Um, because like there was a very distinct blue light here before and there isn't now. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's a little strange and I'm not super comfortable with what I'm seeing. I don't really have a handle on what's going on. What I can tell you is we definitely have some bugs in there or rather, you know, um, sometimes the word bug can be ambiguous in this case. Uh, sometimes a bug means a piece of code that is not that has an error in it, which makes it not work the way it's supposed to work. That's one kind of thing that you might mean by bug. Another thing you might mean by bug, and the one I mean in this case is anything that just produces results that's not what you wanted, right? Because it could be that all of the code, you know, for all we know, the Raycast is working fine, but just the way we're using it is not going to produce the right result, right? Like 
We could just be making mistakes in how we're applying things. And so there's, you know, in this case, we're looking for either kind of bug, a direct uh, bug in the system, and then also, you know, just a bug of the form, oh yeah, you can't, the light's not gonna work if you do it that way or whatever, right? Like that, which is a separate sort of class of bug that isn't the same as, oh, I had a negative in the wrong place, so I was doing the calculation slightly incorrectly and, you know, whatever. Um, <clears throat> So anyway, that's really interesting to me because I would have expected more coherent results to that change. So again, we really have some weird stuff going on here and I'm not sure what. So what I would like to do next um, is I'd like to maybe get a way where we can uh, sort of, I I'd like to have a way where we could visualize the lighting elements more directly again. Uh, so maybe let's try to reconstruct a path where that's gonna happen in a more straightforward fashion. Uh, so what I want to do here is say like, okay, uh, when we do output, um, when we do output lighting textures and output lighting quads and that sort of stuff, is there a way we can get just a visualization instead of the voxel? Uh, if we do output lighting quads here, right? Um, can we get a more direct piece of information? Right. Uh, so here's more information about our lit quads. And uh, what I'd like to do here is we, we have this sort of double counting problem uh, that I mentioned before. And what the double counting problem is, is that these things are still going through the actual lighting solution, right? So what I wanna do um, is I wanna construct a scenario whereby I can look at the lighting solution directly without having the lighting actually get applied, right? And in order to do that, I can do one of two things. Either I can go ahead and create a, uh, I can either go ahead and create a situation where I know that the lighting that I send down is always neutral. So it, there's only one light ever being referenced by any voxel and it's always just a uniform one, one, one. I can do that. Or I can do a mode that actually just turns off the lighting entirely, right? So we can toggle lighting by like pushing a key or something like this. Uh, I'm leaning towards toggling lighting by pushing a key uh, that seems a little bit better to me um, because if we were to do that, then we should be able to, you know, uh, always flip it on and off no matter what we're looking at. So I kind of feel like that's more what I would like to do. So inside the OpenGL renderer, we already have the concept of settings. That was the thing that's that's been in there for a while. Uh, and you can kind of see in here, we've got game render settings, right? And so if we look at the game render settings, you've got like pixelization hint and or pixelation hint and all these other sorts of things, multi-sampling debug, multi-sampling hint, right? Uh, we can have a thing that says lighting disabled or something like this, right? Uh, and so we can have a thing that would toggle lighting disabled. And if the lighting was disabled, we just wouldn't do it. Uh, and so when it comes through here, what we could do is say, all right, we know that the setting uh, is something that we want to read. Uh, so we can just come in here and say, all right, pound define uh, lighting disabled and put it, you know, whatever the value is there. Uh, and then in, in here, in addition to max light power, we would do is say, okay, uh, when we compile the Z bias program, we also need to know that lighting disabled value. Oops. Because this is the only place that we do it. Uh, so it should be pretty straightforward. And so what we would do there is we'd just say like, all right, um, in this code here, we've got all of this nonsense that's designed to help us create some kind of lighting. It's a giant monstrosity that does all these sorts of things. Instead, what we'll do is we'll say if lighting disabled, 
else, do the lighting. Uh, and then what we can say as well, surface effect RGB already equaled this value. Let's not bother multiplying it by the lighting at all. We'll just use the value that we already got, right? Uh, and that's all we would need to do. So now the compiler will tell us that we haven't passed that when we go to compile this program, right? Uh, hello, can I jump to my error? Here we go. Uh, so in here, all we need to do is just take those settings, right? And you can see we've got current settings here, right? Uh, all we need to do is just take those settings uh, and bring them on through. Okay. Uh, so now in theory, if we run this, it should run with the lighting still correctly uh, because we have not set lighting disabled to anything. Uh, so then what we could do is in the settings there, we can actually check the value uh, that we're talking about here. Uh, I don't remember where we actually typically set those uh, or where we set them. I have no idea, I don't remember. <laughs> Uh, but I think where we set them is probably in the top of uh, Handmade where we had a debug switch for them. Yeah. Um, so inside the renderer here, what we can do is just put in lighting disabled and, and now it should be something that can be set, right? Uh, so if I come through here and uh, want to toggle the lighting on and off, so you know, here's it with the lighting on. Uh, in theory, uh, it probably should... <laughs> figure out a way to turn the lighting off on that pass as well. Uh, if I want to set lighting disabled, I should be able to set it to, to true or something. Uh, well, or not. Interesting. So all the rest of the stuff seems to be correctly recalculating, but not lighting disabled. Do we, don't we just do a mem compare? I guess we don't. Do we actually manually do the mem compare and we have to compare them all? So we've got an R equal function. I guess we literally have, yeah. I'm not sure why we don't just compare the memory directly. Uh, are there stuff in there that we don't want to set equal to? I mean, we. what are we checking, I guess, is my question. With height, depth field count, debug, multi-sampling hint. Yeah, I mean, we pretty much just check everything. So I don't understand why we were doing it that way. Uh, let's do it the other way around. Um, I think it's smarter, right? I think that's just better, right? And I don't know if we have one of these. I don't think we do. But this is just saying, hey, uh, we've got a count and uh, two void stars. Right. And I just want to check them. So while count minus minus, if star A plus plus is not equal to star B plus plus, return false, return true. Something like that, right? So basically what we'll say is, all right, however much memory you want to compare, give me two pointers. I'll just go loop through it. If at any point, Two of the bytes are not equal, we'll return false, otherwise we'll return true. Done deal. No one else cares. Finished, right? All right, so now in theory, I should be able to come through and say, okay, disable the lighting. And it actually disables the lighting, right? 
Don't ask me why it clears the lighting afterwards. Probably because the lighting is a permanent texture or something like that. We should probably fix that though. I'd like to be able to toggle the lighting and still have it be there. I guess that won't matter as much later when we're not doing single submission. Um, but yeah. All right. Uh, so yeah, if I was to go in here with lighting disabled, I can now see the lighting directly, right? Uh, and I have to go in and figure out the lighting power uh, more accurately because right now we're not taking that into account. So what I should probably do since we have this lighting power concept now, should probably make a function that encodes how we're encoding it and how we're decoding it so that we don't have to constantly write it all the time, right? So this function basically here, which is like decode power, um, I basically want to say like, uh, hey, I want unpack to be equal to the decode power of unpack and that function, right? Or encoded light uh, is just this. I guess we leave the alpha value the same, or we set the alpha value to one. I don't know what we do there. Probably something like that. Uh, so that we can call this anywhere that we want and have it work, right? Uh, so that way, whenever we're doing anything here that involves that decode, uh, it'll be done uniformly. So for example, in here, when we do front emit, for example, um, uh, we could call the, um, we could call the decode. Uh, similarly, the encode part, we could also do as a value, but I don't think we encode more than one place. So we don't really need to quite do that yet, but this we probably do. Um, so when we do output lighting quads, we come through here and we get these uh, emission values, for example, um, I guess, I guess now that I think about it, when we do output lighting quads here, we're really just kind of saying these are the light values because that light value is so high, uh, it's just gonna clap, clamp up to R anyway. So this is not really a light power situation, I guess. So I guess we really don't have to encode it here. I maybe was a little bit premature in that, pulling that out. Not that it matters, it's a fine thing to pull out anyway, but yeah, it looks like that really isn't that necessary. Because we won't be, we actually won't be decoding the power. Because um, we're just reading it right out of the emitters. Yeah. All right, well, I take it back. Um, so let's go ahead and just take a look at the lighting here, which is what we want to do in the first place. So uh, if I do F1, uh, this is the lighting solution, but it's being itself lit by its own output, right? So I'm gonna hit disable here, so now we can uh, look at it more directly. Uh, so here is what we're seeing as the lighting solution, right? And in theory anyway, um, I believe what I could do here is if I, it should respond properly to the uh, settings of um, how intense the light is. So if we went down here and set this light down to a, a reasonable level, we should see a reasonable lighting solution, not a blown out lighting solution uh, when I do this, right? Um, and let's see if we do. So I don't know, We that still seems really aggressive, right? Um, you know, it's it's less blown out, but it seems just a bit hot to me. Uh, so I'm not sure what exactly is going on there, because if you look at how much light is in the scene here, there's just not a lot of it, right? I mean, it's it's pretty tame. Uh, 
you know? I I don't see a lot of a lot of brightness there really. Uh, and then when I go to disable the lighting and I look at what that lighting solution supposedly was, I just see a lot. I mean, there's some crazy bright emitters there. Um, I don't even know how they're getting the, such bright values. Um, doesn't really make a lot of sense that they could have such bright values. So something seems weird about that. Maybe this is just related to bugs we have to fix in our lighting, but it just seems odd. So I don't know what I'm seeing there and I want to know what's going on because it doesn't feel right. Uh, it feels like there's a bug uh, in that part specifically. So I would be interested to know what it is. The output uh, lighting quads function doesn't do much. Like it just loops through here. It takes the emis emission color values um, and it just outputs them directly, right? And those emit C values uh, are the actual lighting, that, that's before the final gather, right? Uh, so we could also output the final gather color if we wanted to. And the final gather color would be if we used incident light instead. What's interesting about this is I wonder if our emission colors really are that broken. Um, and it'd be interesting to know. So one thing that we could do here is we could make the ability to set sort of a, um, to dynamically set the config value here uh, for the um, iteration count. So this lighting iteration count here, right? We could make this be something we can set dynamically. So for example, uh, and, and that will show show up probably I don't know if we actually expose that um, in the UI let me see if we do should probably put the this in lighting uh, yeah we do so there's this iteration count is actually here we don't have ways to modify uints right now in the debug system we should uh, but we don't um, and so what we'd want to do here is, is actually set this guy uh, equal to something dynamically so we can see like on each bounce how much there is, right? Uh, that would be kind of useful to us. So we could kind of step through those bounces um, and see what happens on each iteration count, right? Uh, so I'm kind of interested in, in looking at that. Um, so let's let's do that real quick. So if we take a look at the F key pressed situation here, I'm just going to hack in a thing that's like, you know, totally random. Uh, so I'll make it be like five and six. So that we can just update that by just pushing the F keys and set it to whatever we want, right? And then we can look at what happens to the emitters as they go. Um, because this will let us see on each iteration where our light actually went, uh, which is handy, right? Uh, so what I should be able to do here, uh, oops, didn't mean to do that, uh, is if I just go ahead and set the lighting off, uh, I should probably set that to disabled. Uh, by default at the moment. But uh, anyway, if we set that uh, and then set this, right? So I should be able to decrease that now, right? So if I have no lighting iterations, we should literally have no light in the scene, right? So when I do my F1, I should get nothing. Uh, and that is what I get. So you can see that only the things that were set as emitters in the first place are still emitters, right? So now if I increase my light uh, step by one. Uh, now you can see I have sent light around the scene and you can see where I sent it, right? Uh, it got sent to these guys out here. It got sent to these guys out here. It got sent to these guys here and so on. 
Now, what I don't necessarily know is whether it should really be that bright. Probably it should not. Um, because since this is a radiative transfer, it probably sampling wise has to be taken into account the fact that we're going outwards from the light source and not backwards from the surface. So these surfaces really aren't as bright as they appear. That's probably just something we need to go improve in the way that we're thinking about light. Um, so from there, if I then do one more step, <clears throat> right? Uh, you can see that now the lighting has spread. You can see where the red light is spread to, and we have some really nonsensical results. And this is, this is revealing some nice bugs. So this is great. We're getting a lot of information here. It should not have been possible for something that was already emitting light like that to change to emitting less. This was an emitter that had a certain amount of em straight emission. Uh, and oops. And what we're seeing there is it's actually been overwritten with a new light color because this bounce affected it. Um, so I think we just want to like kind of retune the way we're doing this in the first place. Like these are some really, this is a really good thing to do. I should have done this a long time ago. Um, and so we can kind of see how that light is continuing to propagate out, right? Uh, <clears throat> so I guess what I'd say is uh, maybe I want to see, we need to kind of think this through because we're getting closer to, to, to goodness here. And so I kind of want to think this through uh, a little bit more carefully. But I think we've, yeah, uh, we should probably go to the Q&A. We've, we've done the time for today, obviously. Uh, but I think we've revealed some really good stuff to work on now. So tomorrow, I think we've clearly got a bunch of stuff we can do that will make an immediate difference. One, let's get this radiation stepping working properly. And I think we just need to like get serious about our sampling and how we're recording that light and tracking it. Um, and, uh, and then step two will be once we have that radiative transfer working more correctly, then we can start to figure out why we're getting these sort of cross interpolation bugs. Is it just because we're putting too many lighting samples next to each other? How are we going to spread those out properly? Like blah, 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 right? So we can really start to hone in on it. I think this is good. I'm going to go ahead and go to the Q&A now. Um, and, uh, I will take questions about the Patreon situation as well because we did talk about that on the actual stream today. So even though normally we only take programming questions, I'll take either question uh, because like I said on this stream, we did actually talk about that specifically. Uh, so any programming questions you folks have or questions about the Patreon situation, I'm happy to field um, at this point. Ah, uh, Flying Solomon says, if you updated your fur coder to the la latest version, you can now edit strings. Uh, yes, I noticed that. I'm pretty excited about that. I have not updated yet. I tend to be a little bit slow on fur coder updates just because I program every day uh, in fur coder all day. And so I typically set aside a little time for every upgrade uh, or do it over the weekend so I don't interrupt my programming with that upgrade process because, you know, something might have changed in the config that I have to go track down or whatever, right? So I tend to always do those updates in a very staged fashion. I am looking forward to it, though, for that reason, among others. Could the ray casting be bouncing off the bounds of the scene? Uh, no, we don't do any bouncing off bounds right now. Uh, what we did do is we have an ambient light that we could turn on, which we did there, but we've, we've turned that off for now. So that's the only thing that comes in from the bounds of the scene. Speedcrunch.org for a great replacement of WinCalc.
All right. I like it. Deep Blue V7 said, could liberapay.com about be a replacement for Patreon? It's nonprofit and paid for by donations to its own Liber Liberapay account. Um, I'm not sure yet. So uh, my first attempt, and I'm trying to talk to Sendal about this, but the people who do the payment processing and download for the Handmade Hero source code have been really great to work with. They have never done anything like this and have always provided a really good service that has been very reliable and that I have really not gotten any complaints about. Um, the only time it ever fails is when people mis-enter their email address when they buy the product. That's about the only problem I've ever had with it. And it's, that's really not Send Owl's fault if people can't put in their actual email address correctly. There's not much you can do, right? Uh, but that's the only failure case I've really experienced with them. Honestly, it's been very good. Uh, so my first thing that I'm going to probably attempt uh, this weekend is to try and work out something where you can just use Sendal directly on handmadehero.org to pledge a monthly or yearly donation. And then that will just get automatically deducted and sent to uh, the projects that I listed in that Patreon email, Handmade Network, um, the Annotations Guide, Milton, Four Coder, uh, the Debugger Projects, right? And uh, that's the first thing I'm going to try. And the reason for that is because it's been around for several years. We've used it reliably. We have, no, have had no problems. They have not pissed anybody off yet. And it's a service we already have to maintain anyway for the source code. I kind of am leaning towards that because I'd rather do that than go with yet another service that might just implode or go out of business or anything else. So... I just feel like putting our eggs in one basket might be good because, hey, if Sendowl went down or something bad happened to it, we would have to move the source code purchase away from it anyway. And so I'd rather just not have two points of failure there. Like every additional one we use is another thing I might have to deal with when that thing goes out of business. Whereas if everything's just at one place, we wouldn't have to just, we just move everything at that point, which you know is, is really no more costly than moving one thing usually. Uh, whereas having it spread out, it already did exactly the thing that, that I wouldn't want to do. Having a Patreon and a Send Owl meant that now one of them goes down, it makes work for me. If I had had a way to do it all through Send Owl in the first place, we would have never had that. Um, so. Just hopped into the stream. Are you working on a global illumination approach specific for 2.5D? Uh, sort of and sort of not. The global illumination approach that we're using is fairly generic and would work in any scene. However, it is specifically tuned to the fact that there's just not a lot of polygons in the scene, right? That things are giant flat cubes or flat plates. And so... If this were a real game, uh, well, it's a real game. If this were a real 3D game, is what I meant to say. Uh, if this were a real 3D game, that would not be true. There would be many, many more millions of polygons in it. And you would not necessarily be able to use this same kind of solution. Now, they do use solutions like this anyway. For example, uh, and, and light? Mm. Oh, darn. I'm not going to remember the name. Uh, I don't think this is the one. Uh, oh, boy. Where is it? It's called like, oh, it is Enlighten. So why didn't that find it? I guess it was just too many. So Enlighten is a, uh, is, it was like a middleware. I think it's used in Dice. It's, it's used in um, 
the Frostbite engine and in the Unreal engine. And I don't know if there's any like good demos of how it works, but, um, and I don't really know what their, I have no idea what their algorithm is, but it is a bounce light around kind of a thing, right? I don't know exactly what they're doing, but it is sort of similar. And I think it works on like point clouds kind of. So there are things that are sort of like this and that do work with, to varying degrees of accuracy with full 3D games with lots of polygons. But that's like a whole other sort of set of things you have to worry about. For us, because we have such low scene detail in terms of geometry, because most of the geometry is in bitmaps, right? Most of the geometry is what the artist drew. We don't have that problem of trying to capture radiosity on million polygon scenes, 10 million polygon scenes, 100 million polygon scenes. So while we are not doing anything specific for 2.5D, we are doing a more brute force approach to global illumination than would ever be feasible if you were doing a non 2.5D game. So that part is more 2.5D. Hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> Quickshift said, I'm out of the loop. What's up with Patreon? Uh, Patreon basically, well, they've done two, th two big sort of things now that made people unhappy. Um, one was they sort of started banning people from the platform on ideological grounds to a certain extent. And there was argument definitely on whether it was ideological or not, but people definitely interpreted it poorly. And they didn't like the idea of Patreon banning people from a platform based on non-illegal activity or something. I, I mean, I don't know what, I can't summarize why people were upset because people were upset because they were upset. Anyway, they had a bad situation with that. And it ruffled some feathers because people want to think of Patreon as a way of supporting people they agree with, not as a way of supporting people that Patreon agrees with, right? And you can understand why that ruffles some feathers. That was okay I, to a certain extent, but they definitely lost some subscribers there but it wasn't catastrophic literally two months later a month later it has not been long since that incident kind of flared up a little bit and made some people upset then they did something which upset almost everybody like this was not even ideological and it wasn't really even um something that that formed really pockets of people who agreed or disagreed with patreon uh basically just a week or two ago they sent out an email saying that they're completely changing the way pledges are counted and they tried to make it sound like a positive change, but actually it's a very negative change for a lot of people who use the system. Uh, it's gonna mean that uh, before when they were pledging a dollar to something and paying a dollar for the pledge, they're now gonna to have to pay a dollar 38 cents for the pledge and things like this. It's like, and the amount that the, pa that the patrons receive is not necessarily going up depending on the circumstances and blah, blah, blah. So it's like, it's basically a much worse way of doing pledges because Previously, what would happen is all of your pledges would be aggregated together and you just have a credit card bill. Let's say you pledge to 50 people and you only pledged a dollar to each of them. So you're only pledging a dollar to, say, the Handmade Hero Patreon. But you pledge to a lot of people, so it ends up being $50 a month. That $50 charge might incur some credit card fees, but it would be credit card fees related to that charge. So it would be 2% or 3% of the $50, $50 charge plus whatever the 25 cents or something, you know, whatever a credit card fee is, you'd end up paying $54, $55 or something for a $50 worth of pledges. This made sense to people. Now what Patreon is doing is they're disaggregating all pledges and each pledge is an individual charge in a weird way. So what ends up happening is if you do $51 pledges, each of those pledges incurs a 25 cent or a 35 cent fee plus 2% on top of that or plus 3%. I don't remember what it is. But basically the long and short of it is if you do $51 pledges, you pay 50 times $1.38 roughly. Uh, so, you know, that ends up being something like 70 bucks or whatever, right? A big difference. And the creators aren't taking home much more money. In fact, they're in oftentimes taking home less money potentially or equivalent money, but you're paying way more. So the percentage that the, pay, that the actual person you're pledging to actually receives from these smaller dollar donations plummet, plummets dramatically. Um, and they published an extremely, this was a thing that I feel, like I said, a lot of things, you know, the internet, everyone's always outraged about everything. So before they were sort of having more of that problem where like people are upset because people are always upset and no matter what you do, they're upset. Um, and that's one thing. 
This was a lot different because this one started to get into really bad territory of just seeming like you were kind of trying to pull a fast one on people. And nobody likes that, even people who don't get internet outraged about things. Um, and I'll kind of show you a little bit of what I mean by that. This, this even to me, trying to be fair to them was really hard to see how this happens in a realistic scenario. So here's the thing that they published, you know, and this is, this is like them trying to convince you this was a good idea, right? And they printed a graph and it looks like this. And what you can see here is this is what they're saying here was before the Patreon pledge, um, before their change, they're saying, all right, creators take home 85 to 93% because there's a transaction fee of between two and 10% and then Patreon takes their 5% cut, right? Now this is a legitimate graph. It doesn't make a lot of sense to make a graph that has ranges in it without drawing those ranges, but whatever, they picked the max of this, right? They took 10% stuck it here, 5% stuck it here, and this was the 15%, uh, the 85% here, right? So that's whatever, right? This is a fair diagram. It probably does sort of represent what happened, although I would argue it's not, it, this is still not accurate because VAT moss and local taxes get stuck on here as well. So really it's more like, you know, uh, 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 there's another percentage in here that has to do with um, country taxes and that gets added on top of this, right? So there should be another percentage on here drawn in that's an overage of the pledge amount that you just had to pay because I'm pretty sure VATMOS, VATMOS by law has to be tacked on so they must have been doing that uh, in other countries because they're required to and they would get sued if they didn't or, or not sued, uh, prosecuted, right? But anyway, let's take VAT moss and taxes out of it for a second. This, if you take taxes out of the equation, is a reasonable representation about what was happening to your pre-tax contribution. They then showed this diagram. And if you look at this diagram, you can see that what they've done is they've taken the previous 100% that was here and said, look, creators now take home 95%. That's more than even the highest percent here. Patreon takes 5%. Uh, that looks pretty good, right? But then, oh, there's like a service fee on here, which is 2.9% plus 0.35 cents, right? Now, this at least starts to correctly represent the fact that there are charges above the pledge amount, right? Again, this one probably should have had it for taxes and they're not getting represented here, but whatever. So here, the same would be true. There should be taxes on here. Now, they're also showing that the service fee, which is previously this red bar here. Now, don't do not ask me why they changed which color was which. That's just, again, straight up bizarre. It tells me the people who made these charts have no idea what they're doing, but that's a separate issue, right? You should, the colors should be constant here. This should have been this color. This should have been this color or vice versa, but you get what's going on, right? So this makes it sound like, and in all of the text here is sounds like they're doing you a favor, right? But what they neglect to mention here in the classic how to lie with statistics sense is 35 cents is not a percentage. So you can't put it on a percentage graph. What that means is this bar is 100% fictitious. We have no idea how big it should actually be until we decide how much actual money is represented by this graph, right? So what we actually have is a situation where this black bar could be like enormous. In fact, let's say a patron pledged, pledged only 20 cents, right? If a patron pledged only 20 cents, just the 35 cents alone would be longer than this entire bar, right? On the other hand, if a patron pledged $10,000, then this 35 cent piece would be nothing. It would be invisible, right? And herein lies the problem. So what you end up with is a situation where whether this is good or not, despite the graph trying to make it appear like it is always good, is in fact awful for anyone who makes a small dollar pledge. The smaller your pledge, the harder this affine 35 cents kicks in to make it so that most of what you're paying actually goes to the service fee, right? And so the problem here, more so than the service fee charge, which in and of itself was probably a bad decision for anyone donating uh, small amounts of money. It would not affect people donating large amounts. People giving $50, $100, this graph is pretty accurate. People giving $5, $2, $1, which is a lot of people on Patreon 
give a small amount, right? They don't have a lot of money or they give to a lot of things. So, you know, maybe they're even giving a thousand dollars a month, but they're giving to lots and lots of Patreons, right? So either way, you might be, you might not have very much money and you're just trying to give what you can, or you might have a lot of money, but you're giving to lots of people, right? Either case, what happens now is your donation amount gets clobbered by this fee, right? This 35 cent fee, $1, $2 donations, that 35 cent fee is a huge percentage, right? 35 cents at the risk of stating the obvious is 35% of a $1 pledge. That's a massive amount going to fees. And they tried to slip it by everyone with graphs like this and statements like 95% of every pledge goes to creators, right? I don't know what to say. It seems very disingenuous that they decided to present it this way. I don't understand why someone would have said these things or drawn this graph if they weren't intentionally trying to manipulate public opinion to think this change was more universally good than it was, right? And I think that's what people have really latched onto and why they're getting angry. Because yes, they are probably upset that people who are giving $1 a month to various things, they're upset that this is gonna cost them a lot more money now and then they can't give as much money to the people they're trying to support. I am sure that's a big part of it, but I think the real sort of anger and out, uh, the, the um, lashing out at them for this and canceling Patreons, canceling pledges, all that stuff is coming from the fact that they didn't humbly apologize for this change and say, we had no choice, we have to do this because of credit card companies making us do this or, we felt like we had to do this because of X, Y, and Z, they sold it. Like they said, this was great for everybody. They were trying to pull a fast one on you, it appears, right? So whether they were or not, I don't know, but that's what it came across as. And they haven't done anything to assuage people's fears that that was the case. They've just doubled down and said, no, this is better. They keep insisting it's better. And they don't seem to be listening to people say like, no, it really isn't. Um, I don't, and so I don't know what to say. Uh, and so that's the Patreon flame out that appears to be happening now. And like I said, unlike the last time where they kind of had this sort of a thing, uh, now this seems to be a lot more dangerous. Uh, like, uh, this is this could be like a site ending thing for them. I know so many. Uh, I think just we're closing the Handmade Hero Patreon on Monday at the latest, I think. Um, what, after that's closed, that plus the other people I know who have closed their Patreons, you're probably talking about three, $4,000 worth of, of contributions just from my friends who aren't big Patreon. You, like, I don't know anyone who's making $10,000 off of Patreon, right? I know only people who are making a few hundred dollars off of Patreon, right? Just out of the people I know, which is four or five people or something, right? It's not very many, six, eight, I don't know. The number that have closed have taken out several thousand dollars just from that small group. And so assuming the wider internet looks similarly, they're, this is going to like cut in half their net value or more just, just this one weekend. This one mistake will literally half the size of their thing if that's any indication. Um, so I, they messed up. I don't know what to say. It's in the world of the internet, the bonuses, you can become an overnight cessation really quick. I mean, Hey, handmade hero is a good example of something that I never thought would have so many people watching every day. And so many people watching videos on demand. So that's the power of the internet for you. It happened almost overnight, just right when we started, right? The internet can do that. It can also punish you incredibly harshly, perhaps more harshly than you deserve, right? Um, that's the reality of the world we live in. I'm sorry, Patreon. Like, uh, you know, maybe you were just trying to do a good thing. I don't know. Maybe you're unscrupulous. I don't know either. I have no idea what your deal is. I don't know anyone at Patreon. Um, I have no idea what their morals are or ethics. I don't know if they're fundamentally trying to do good things or if they're the types of people who maybe started out trying to do good things and is now like Silicon Valley VC nastiness, like, you know, rolling around in, in, in my Tesla, like eating $12 toast and talking about like, you know, 
who's in the C-suite kind of stuff. Like, I don't know what kind of people they are, what kind of people they've become. And generally speaking, I try not to make that kind of value judgment. I, sometimes I do, and I've been trying lately because I've seen how horrible it is when people do that on the internet. I've been trying not to do that. I just, I try to like literally take at face value, like, what is this thing doing? Do I like it or not? Let me not try to figure out whether someone who once worked at the company maybe someday made a t comment on Twitter that I wouldn't have liked, right? I've tried to stop doing that because it seems awful the way people do that on the internet now. Um, so I don't know and I don't want to try to read behind the motives of this change. All I can say is, yeah, I'm uncomfortable about it too things like that chart make me really nervous. Those look like the kinds of things people do when either they're really, really stupid, like so stupid they can't even figure out how to make the math for a chart, or they're just kind of unscrupulous and are trying to make things look better than they are, right? I don't know a lot of other explanations than manipulative or incredibly dumb. Um, Either way, don't really want to be relying on a platform by people who are either of those two things. So to me, it's a good time to get off of it. It was never a source of revenue for Handmade Hero anyway. It was only a way to get donations into the project that we could then pay out to other projects who were on volunteer support. Uh, and so I'm just going to figure out another way to get that done and close down the page and point everyone at some other thing they can use. Uh, hopefully a send owl page that will just work. Uh, that's fingers crossed, but that's what I'm going to do. Uh, so there will be no handmade hero Patreon page uh, very shortly. It will go away. I already sent a message out to all the patrons say, hey, stick with it for a couple days. Uh, we're going to try and, and uh, fix something here. So, so that's what we're doing. Uh, whether Patreon itself survives this incident, I have no idea. I've never seen so many people cancel their accounts at somewhere so quickly as this. Um, I don't have an explanation for that other than the fact that I feel like there's a difference between commercial and altruistic funding models that means you have less leeway here. If you are Nike and you're selling someone sneakers, that's a fundamentally commercial venture. And if people find out that you're using sweatshop labor and they don't like that, there may be a slight backlash against you and you can respond to that backlash, et cetera, et cetera but it is fundamentally a commercial transaction with different rules and different expectations. Patreon is not that kind of a service. Patreon is a service that exists solely because people are trying to feel like they're doing a good thing, supporting projects they care about. And when you have a service, I think that is 100% about goodwill. Like that is the only thing that they are trading on, right? It is not a commercially oriented service. People are not going there for commercial transactions primarily. I think what that means, just again, this is data free, this is just my gut take on it, because I don't know. I think you probably just have a lot less rope, right? Um, you're fundamentally dealing with people, with creators who want to be portraying themselves in a positive light to the people who are supporting them, whatever that means, right? And you have patrons who want to feel like they're doing a good thing by using the site. When that is the fundamental understanding and there is no commercial part on top of it, right? Or very little. I think you just have so much less rope than a Starbucks or a Nike or whoever who do still care about their image because it can affect their uh, sales or whatever, right? But it's, it's a lot less of it. Most of the time you're going to Starbucks because it's the close coffee shop and, you're and you think the coffee's fine or whatever, right? You're much less concerned about exactly how much is going to fair trade coffee and exactly how much environmentally friendly building materials went into their sofa or whatever. There are people who care about that to certain degrees, but it's not the, it's not the main reason you went into the, to the Starbucks, right? It's just a thing Starbucks is trying to do uh, either for them to feel good about themselves as a company or for you to feel better about yourselves about buying the coffee, but that's all. Whereas something like Patreon, I think it just, it's a lot higher risk of something like this because the only reason you went there was to feel like you were doing a good thing to support somebody who was making something you cared about. That's the only reason you showed up. 
So I feel like they just don't have a lot of slack. And if they're going to make a change like this, they have to really think it through a lot harder than they did. Vet it a lot harder than they did with their patrons and their um, creators. Because this was a two-week thing. Caught everyone by surprise, right? They have to take it, I think, a lot more seriously because they are not the same as a standard commercial company. That the, It is not a service-first um positive feeling second which i think would be how you describe most commercial ventures right it's not transaction first positive feeling second it's the opposite it's positive feeling first transaction second company so if you do something to ruin that positive feeling you are way more exposed to backlash than i think anyone else would be in the commercial sphere for uh this kind of a thing right so again, not an informed take, not a data-based analysis. I have no idea if what I just said is at all accurate, but my like kind of gut instinct is just that that is a real problem for them. And I think what we're seeing now is an outsized effect that this change has, been, has had, specifically because they are much more susceptible, I would suspect, to negative sentiment hurting their uh, customer sort of uh, loyalty and engagement than what a normal commercial venture would hope to experience, right? When they, when they have a misstep. Uh, Dervin, I've been having a lot of trouble with staying motivated and inspired for new projects. Do you have any tips on how to take an idea and actually bring it fully into existence? Um, not really. I mean, I guess what I would say is there's a couple ways you can do it. Number one is you have to make sure that you're programming every day and you're programming for like several hours every day. And that's the first thing to look at separately. If you find that it's hard to program every day for several hours, either A, you need to do serious behavioral work on yourself to make that happen, or you need to reassess whether you wanted to be a programmer, right? Not everyone should be a programmer and not everyone involved in software should be a programmer, right? There's lots of other things you can do. There's management, there's art, there's design, there's all sorts of other things that people do in the software world that have nothing to do with actually coding every day. So you have to assess that, right? Do I actually like coding every day? Just the act of programming, right? And if the answer to that is yes, then the next step is, okay, is my main problem that I constantly switch around what I'm programming on and I never program long enough on something to finish it. If that's really all you're talking about, there's a couple of different things you can do. One, start picking smaller projects. Sticking, pick a smaller project and work your way up. Instead of picking, you know, uh, I want to make the next Call of Duty, right, which is nuts and involve tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of work. How about I want to make the next Asteroids clone, right? And that's it. Uh, start smaller, pick smaller projects, and work your way up. Great way to start going. Gain some confidence in shipping smaller things before you try to ship bigger things uh, is a great thing to do. Two, uh, spec things specifically and only finish what you spec, right? So uh, that's not a great way to do real projects because real products, especially game products, take refinement. They take learning from your mistakes. They take uh, revisions. But again, if you're having trouble, start with something where you're like, I'm gonna write down on paper exactly what this thing is gonna do, and I'm gonna do exactly that, and nothing else is going in here, no more refinements. I'm shipping that as version one, end of story, right? That can help cut down on the feature creep and the meandering and the worrying that the thing isn't good, so I can't finish it because it's just not coming together and I need to do stuff to fix it. No, whatever's in the spec, we ship it. If it's a turd, it's a turd. Even if I only ship it myself on GitHub, whatever, I'm finishing it so I can have the experience of getting it done and learning what that means, right? That's another good thing to do. Finally, the nuclear option, get a loan, take money, start a project over your head that you will have to finish because you're freaking out because you don't know how to pay back the money, right? And that's the way to do bigger projects. <laughs> um, having a producer or an investor or somebody breathing down your neck and expecting demos is a real good way to force yourself to get work done, right? Uh, other than that, I don't know a lot of options. And which options right for you or feasible for you depends on what your situation is, what your means are, what, your, what you can do, 
uh, what you can afford to do, what you can mentally take for stress, all that sort of stuff. Um, I would obviously start start with the non-taking money ones first uh, and start to try and get reasonably sure you can ship things before you try to do something a little more drastic like that. But, you know, I, I couldn't tell you. That's, that's all the options I know of. There's no magic answer. You just got to find out what works for you. Um, one other thing I would mention is if you're always working alone, start working with somebody else. Uh, it doesn't have to be another programmer, but somebody else who you're working with can help you stay motivated because if you're both working on something that's like sort of mutually reinforcing oftentimes find somebody else hopefully maybe someone who's even more motivated than you are on a typical daily basis and hope that that will sort of bleed over right into your motivation because they'll be expecting deliverables from you and that will reinforce your ability to work did you ever get dependency to work the new version uh, i didn't i never tried after that stream i just was like well nope doesn't work and i'm out of here I'm fairly new to the series, only on episode 13. Do you recommend coding along with the series? I personally like to just watch and learn rather than copying everything you type, but I don't know. Um, I would say that it depends on what you're trying to learn from the series. If you're pretty new to programming or pretty new to game programming, I think you may want to do some coding along with the series. It doesn't have to mean that you copy what I do, but it maybe means you should try to do some side products or some side coding after you watch an episode and do the same sorts of things I'm doing just to cement that learning in place, because otherwise I feel like it might be a little bit too ephemeral. If on the other hand, you're a pretty accomplished programmer, but maybe just haven't done programming of the sorts of things that I'm doing here, and you just want to kind of see some new techniques or learn some things um, that you're just going to apply like randomly on like that sort of thing, then I'd say just watching it seems fine because you already know what you're doing. You don't need me to show you most stuff. You're just kind of picking up odds and ends along the way. That seems like it'll just kind of sink in just fine. So I would say it depends on what kind of learning you're trying to do, where you're at right now. Uh, and only you can really answer that question, probably. Have you considered applying for a Twitch partner? I would subscribe. Uh, we have not done that because in the past, their contract has not allowed us to post YouTube videos right away. And uh, we so we had that issue with their standard contract. Um, I might revisit it. I don't think the numbers of subscribers we would get would make a significant impact to us in terms of monetary, um, in terms of income. For the project uh but you know it's pe something people do ask about and i guess you maybe get benefits from it i'm not sure uh but uh, yeah I, you know i i could certainly look into it again I, but like i said it's not a real high priority for us consider getting a bitcoin litecoin and ethereum wallet it's an easy way for people to donate it's hard to get your money out of it though but i think it could be worth it um does send all support bitcoin So, you know, I haven't really looked at this, um, but I, I do think I can turn on Bitcoin for purchases in SendOwl. I will look at that. Uh, and if so, if we switch to a SendOwl donation system as well, then you'd be able to buy the source code with Bitcoin or the um, uh, or pledge. So I, I will add that to things I look at, hopefully, as I get a SendOwl system in place. Uh, oh, Kalimian posted a link. Uh, Kalimian, what, what is this link blog post about Patreon onboarding? Uh, what's in the post? Can you tell me what, what should I be looking for in there? I'll, I'll bring it up. First of all, anyone who says like onboarding growth, I already don't like. I mean, that's just a little bit of my prejudice against Silicon Valley in general. But I mean, I'll be honest. If you use the term onboarding growth, I already probably don't want to be in business with you. <laughs> what can you say? Um, uh
Yeah, I mean, I guess like this kind of here, like, you know, I suppose this here kind of tells you what you need to know about the way they look at pay at, at their platform, right? They, they're sort of saying like, hey, unsuccessful Patreons, which I guess we are probably technically a successful Patreon because um, we're like $800, $900, something like that. Uh, but, you know, someone making $50 a month, I guess they're kind of saying we don't care about you because you're not contributing to our viral loop and we're, you're not generating enough revenue. I don't know. Um, The fundamental problem was that our acquisition and activation funnel had a high ratio of people who were still early in the process of building their fan base, meaning they were coming to the site and not succeeding. Creators must have an established online following, even if small, and post at a regular frequency online. The specific frequency can vary by creator, but Christopher is right. We were attracting people who saw creators getting paid and succeeding on Patreon, and they would misunderstand this and attribute a reverse causality. They would think that launching a Patreon page, okay, that seems fine though, that's true. Um, it made our funnels, our funnels useless. Uh, it's great to see other creators launch and promote their pages and succeed financially. As a result, our virality is through visibility more than explicit invitations like we see on Dropbox or on social network. Project Mondo and Counterintuitive Growth Experimentation. The Patreon team took a hard look at their growth levers and realized that to me, it, you know, it really sucks that Silicon Valley, like 95% of it seems like what they think about all day is like how to manipulate people into using their platform. Now I can appreciate the fact that it's a nuclear arms race, right? Like it's kind of like, uh, well, because, you know, Google is spending all of their time figuring out how to manipulate people into, you know, looking at their ads or whatever. We have to spend all day thinking about how we manipulate people into using our platform and, you know, Uber has to think about all day how they manipulate people into using their ride sharing service and blah, blah, blah. Like, I understand that fact, but it's still, it still sucks. Like, it's still, it's like, it's not good just because everyone... It's kind of like nuclear weapons. It's not great that we all have them. I understand why everyone has to have them, but it's not like I'm happy about the fact that all of these bad things are existing. And, and I would say that this is the kind of thing that just leaves an awful feeling, right? Because you're just like, oh, God. Like, I can tell you the amount of time we have spent thinking about our handmade hero purchasing funnel is exactly zero. We don't even have a funnel. We just have a web page with a button on it. Uh, let's see here. Two team of two. Oh, I thought that said two point one engineers. In fact, doesn't that say two point one engineers? It was implemented by a team of two point one engineers. Does that mean they took somebody and cut him off at the ankles and just put his feet onto the team? Or what? what is a point one engineer? Does anyone know what that means? Maybe that's just because the programmers at Patreon are so bad that they only count for point one of an engineer or something. So 2.1 engineers is, is actually like 21 engineers at an company where people know what they were doing or something i don't know what that means that's a i don't know what that means at all but I, hey, maybe it's silicon valley speak for people working a tenth of the time on something like one out of every t one day out of every two weeks is that a point one engineer uh let's see it's called project mondo by the way it's like mondo dude oh here's a diagram uh, chain reaction, the highest leverage metric of Patreon's growth model is new financial creators who trigger further 
greater virality as well as help bring more patients to the conscious side. The, on the as service, software as a service side, activation in the viral funnel is as valuable as direct shares, okay? Uh, so here's the loop, I guess. You guys all got this? There's a new creator. That creator launches a Patreon page. They promote via multiple channels. The audience sees that page and then the the percentage of the audience who are also creators click through and enter the new creator flow. So this is correct. I mean, this is what happened with Handmade Hero, right? People asked me to create a page, I did. Other Handmade Hero related projects saw that page that was promoted by other channels and then it created, like we did this exact loop. So they're not wrong. Uh, What if you kept the same amount of shares but doubled your rate of onboarding? Improving funnel conversion is a powerful way. Sharing happens out there. Sharing can be a product, whatever. Onboarding success rate is exponential function. Onboarding success affects all our metrics. Okay, defining franchise of creators. In order for the Patreon's onboarding experience to have a compounding viral effect, the company had to be able to identify and single out the segment of creators that had the greatest potential to achieve financial success. So basically, they're kind of like, it's a winner's outs thing. They're kind of trying to help people who already need the least help, if you will, right? It's kind of like a Donald Trump tax plan or something, right? It's kind of like a, we want to find people who are already winning and help them win more or whatever. The criteria for having a fine creator, creator cost driven, uh, has an absolute number of followers. Right? So instead, the team looks for a quality combination of engagement, how consistently the people who are engaging are engaging, right? Uh, okay. It's like the ultimate end quantitative criteria of a certain level of monetary earnings because it's simple and functional for the growth team to optimize for that. So then how do they, so how do they actually help those people though? I mean, I understand how you might go about identifying which people you think could make more money than they are making easily, like without a lot of work, but I'm not sure how you help them. So how did they help them? Here's to immediately grasp how to use Patreon, but with a few concrete examples, they come alive and totally get it. Uh, I'm not sure what this means. In category comparables. We can't do Patreon, doesn't have extra and grad. Those complaints were really just a smoke screen for a more fundamental fear of having Patreon sending a beggar's bowl. Uh, the Christian only put sales and asked their colleague, it's easy, I just show someone on Patreon whom they respect in their category and then they don't care anymore. Okay, so they basically say like, look, you know, um, such and such a famous person who you like is using Patreon to beg for money, so you should beg for money too. That makes sense. All of these seem fairly reasonable if Manipulative, right? Um, We have creators using our office all the time. They meet our teams of CEO. They so. What? We thought about Patreon, but any tool we tried, we would rock through it with a fake account to vet it. Does this feel reliable? Is this going to make us look amateur in front of our fans? Is this something that serious creators would use? Not just some guy who took his first guitar lesson. We encountered a lot of opportunities opposition in the organization. WYSIWYG is the most common best practice. Make it easy, make it frictionless. Most core professionals have heard this before. Some of these people on the internet are stupid and improve conversions or streamline we have to dumb down. <clears throat> the 
team also understands that their tool is fulfilling a use case that's highly personal and very emotional. There's a lot of vulnerability. They might fail in front of their fans. People on the internet aren't always looking for low friction scenarios and are functioning perfectionists. Uh, All right, that doesn't really matter. So I guess, I don't know. I mean, other than being kind of distasteful, I'm not really th sure, like, uh, like, that's just like, yeah, this is a Silicon Valley, you know, marketing kind of nonsense, right? It seems like it's roughly accurate. Uh, definitely you know double suggest that patreon doesn't maybe care about low dollar donations because they're not going to maybe comprise enough of their income which would explain why they don't you know maybe why they made this fee change and thought it wouldn't be a big deal because they're mostly thinking about people who give 50 dollars a month to a project rather than people who give one dollar a month maybe but i don't know it's not there wasn't that much stuff in here it's kind of just a big old silicon valley standard nonsense kind of a thing Uh, okay. Dragoon X6, what do you think of Git large file storage or any other Git large asset plugins over centralized source control such as SVN or Perforce? Um, I've been taking a look and for free as in pay solution, I actually came to Mercurial with its large asset plugin. What do you recommend? Uh, we use custom stuff at Molly. So I don't have a recommendation on if you don't have your own source code system, I don't know what you would use exactly. Um, I don't think particularly highly of Git. It's just not really stable to me. It's a giant collection of like Python scripts, I think. It, it, Git is just not the kind of thing I would trust really anything too. It's just kind of way too sprawling and it's not concise enough for a system that's handling like the most precious bits. You know, I don't, I don't, so I wouldn't use something like that, but I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't, I don't. So I don't know if you're going to have to use something, maybe gets the best thing. I don't know. Um, I, I know people have used, uh, oh, sorry, Perl. Yeah. Not Python, Perl scripts. Uh, I don't know if Mercurial is better than Git or gets better than Mercurial. I don't know if, you know, I know that the witness, for example, used Subversion. It didn't use either of those two. And was it fabulous? Maybe not. Did it work? Yes. Did it ever lose anything? No. So, you know, there's definitely projects out there that are really huge, probably bigger than whatever you're doing, um, that used Subversion just fine. Um, so... You know, uh, that's all, that's all I could say about that. Uh, so I don't have a personal recommendation. I have worked on one project, namely the witness that did do everything, including the art assets through Subversion, and it worked. Um, it did not pose too many problems. Um, although I do think they had to do a little bit of work with it, it uh, for certain circumstances. Uh, I think those things were related more, though, to uh, NTFS's slow file enumeration stuff, maybe than they than they had to actually do with um, Subversion. So I'm not sure that I'm not sure if they ever really had a problem with Subversion directly. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, but what I can say is that, you know, they're still using it. As far as I know, all of John's projects still go through Subversion. So he's not the kind of person who would keep using a system if it was completely intractable. Although that said, he's still using Emacs. But generally speaking, no. Uh, and uh, I think if it was causing a lot of problems, he would have done something different. 
Uh, so I feel like Subversion is probably a pretty safe bet as well in, in there. I don't know if Git or Mercurial is like a better choice in some way, but I think Subversion would, I would include that in your list of things that maybe you would use. Oh, wait, you did. You said SVN or, or Perforce, not just Perforce. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know. Uh, uh, all right, let's go ahead and wrap it up. I think we have covered everything in a few colons. And we talked about the Patreon fiasco as well. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. If you want to support the series and you would like access to the source code or either of those two things, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org. Don't click the Patreon link, though, because that's going away. Uh, we will have this button removed sometime shortly, but the other buttons will still be there. You will still be able to pre-order the source code through Sundial, obviously. You'll still be able to go to the forum site and ask questions. You will still be able to use the schedule bot to find out when we're going to be live, and you will still be able to look at the episode guide until tomorrow, when hopefully I'll have a little bit more information about uh, what we will be replacing Patreon with. Please have fun programming. And I will see everyone on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.